nine. Ignition sequence. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing. Not because they are easy, but because they are hard. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. One, zero, and lift off. Our mission complete, Houston. After uh, serving the world for over 30 years, the space shuttle turned its place in history and has come to a final stop. Good morning and welcome to Mission Control Houston and the International Space Station update. We're here with the International Space Station Flight Control Team inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room at the Mission Control Center in Houston. Today's Flight Director is Tomas Gonzalez-Torres and he's joined today by two Capcoms actually. Hal Getzelman uh, at the uh, top center of the screen is a familiar face at that console but he's accompanied here by Kate Rubens who is training for the Capcom position. Here on the ground today, the team, and in particular engineers of the European Space Agency, is looking into what caused a reboost of the space station yesterday to cut off early. The reboost started at 11 a.m. Central Time yesterday and was supposed to last for 31 minutes and 16 seconds. However, the automated transfer vehicle's thrusters, which were being used to boost the station to a higher orbit, cut off after 20 minutes and 37 seconds. That reboost was part of a strategy to use the propellant delivered by the automated transfer vehicle and begin setting the station up for the next Soyuz departure on September 17th, as well as the progress launch that's going to follow it at the beginning of November. At the moment, it's at an altitude of 255.5 miles by 249.6. Another reboost could be planned for as early as Wednesday to add a couple of miles to that and leave the station in a 257.8 by 251.7 mile orbit. On board the International Space Station, Six Expedition 32 crew members are halfway through their day. Commander Gennady Padaka, U.S. Flight Engineers Joe Akaba and Sonny Williams, Japanese Flight Engineer Aki Hoshide, and Russian Flight Engineers Yuri Malenchenko and Sergei Revin got their wake-up call at 1 a.m. Central Time this morning to start a full day of science and maintenance activities, as well as spacewalk preparations. The crew has been together now for almost a, or about a full month. Uh, Williams, Hoshide, and Malenchenko arrived aboard their Soyuz 31S on July 16th, and they've been in space now for 33 days and at the space station for 31. And they're planning to stay until November. Hakaba, Padaka, and Revan, on the other hand, launched on May 14th and have been in space for 94 days now at the station for 92. They'll be heading back to Earth in their own Soyuz vehicle next month. The crew is currently flying at an altitude of about 260 miles above the uh, Pacific Ocean, just about to reach the southernmost portion of this orbit around the Earth and begin heading northeast across South America. The first item on today's agenda for the entire crew was a safety briefing to prepare, the upcoming, to prepare for the upcoming Russian spacewalk scheduled for Monday. The entire crew got together to talk through what those inside should be prepared for in the unlikely event of an emergency. And then the spacewalkers, Gennady Padaka and Yuri Malenchenko, went to work getting their spacesuits moved into place and gathering their equipment and tools. Meanwhile, here on the ground, the flight controllers are moving the space station's robotic arm, Canada Arm 2, from the Harmony node across the Destiny Laboratory and then into the arm's mobile base to get it into position to provide good camera views of the spacewalk which is scheduled to begin at 9.40 a.m. on Monday, with NASA TV coverage picking up at 9 a.m. Central Time. The rest of the station's crew spent at least part of their day working on a variety of sci science experiments. Flight engineer Joe Acaba performed a run of the BASS experiment, that stands for Burning and Suppression of Solids, and tests the hypothesis that all other things being equal, materials in microgravity burn as well or better than they would in gravity. Flight engineer Sonny Williams replaced a camera on the InSpace 3 experiment, which studies the fundamental behavior of magnetic colloidal fluids under the influence of various magnetic fields in hopes of improving our ability to design structures such as bridges and, earth, uh, and bridges uh, to better withstand earthquakes. Flight engineer Aki Hoshide, meanwhile, prepared for another segment of uh, the integrated cardiovascular experiment that looks at how being in space affects astronauts' heart muscles. And he also replaced a disk drive on the combustion integrated 
racks, fluid, and combustion facility. And on the Russian side of the station, flight engineer Sergei Revin worked on the identification and bar experiments. Identification is aimed at identifying sources of vibrations that disrupt the microgravity conditions on the space station. Those conditions are important for many of the experiments that go on on board the space station. And the bar experiment looks at different methods of detecting leaks on the station. That's what's going on in space today, and this is Mission Control Houston. Good morning and welcome to Mission Control Houston and the International Space Station update. On board the International Space Station, the uh, six Expedition 32 crew members are halfway through their day. As they have this entire week, all members of the crew spent time today preparing for one spacewalk or another. Of course, the first in line is the Russian spacewalk scheduled to start at 9.40 a.m. Central Time on Monday. Commander Gennady Padaka and Flight Engineer Yuri Malinchenko are going to be going out of the Piers docking apartment on the Russian side of the station and spending six and a half hours on a variety of tasks. The primary one is the relocation of the Strela 2 crane from the Piers to the Zarya module to get ready for the replacement of the Piers with the Russian multi-purpose laboratory module scheduled to come up to the station next year. Padaka and Malinchenko, with help from Flight Engineer Sergei Revin, are spending their day making final preparations for that spacewalk. They put on the Orlon Russian spacesuits that they're going to be wearing on Monday to perform a fit check. And Revan also went through some checkouts of the communication channels that they'll be using. Again, that uh, spacewalk is scheduled to begin at 9.40 a.m. Central Time on Monday. And NASA TV coverage of the event will start at 9 a.m. On the U.S. side of the station, the spacewalk is a bit further away. It's scheduled for August 30th, but preparations are also well underway there. Flight engineer Sunny Williams and Aki Hoshide are going to be performing that spacewalk, which will also last six and a half hours, and its primary task is going to be the replacement of a main bus switching unit that's expected to fail before too long. Williams and Hoshide are spending much of their afternoon reviewing procedures for the excursion, and flight engineer Joe Akapa is joining in, going over the, his duties, choreographing the uh, spacewalk from inside the station. Crew is still managing to squeeze in plenty of scientific work today, too, though. Flight engineer Joe Akaba began the day working on the BCAT experiment, that's binary colloidal alloy test, which is studying nanoscale particles dispersed in liquids. Those are the colloidal suspensions. And uh, they're often used in paints, electronic polishing compounds, and food products. Akaba then moved from uh, that onto the advanced colloids experiment, which takes advantage of the space station's environment to study flow characteristics, evolution, and ordering effects in colloidal materials and microgravity. And he also spent some time changing out a cable on the fluid integrated rack that provided white light to the facility's microscope. Williams and Hoshide were both scheduled to spend some more time on the integrated cardiovascular experiment, which looks at how astronauts' hearts change after spending long times in macrogravity. And in addition, Williams performed some troubleshooting on the Isaac experiment. That's the International Space Station Agricultural Camera, which is used to take images in visible and infrared lights of crops, grasslands, and forests, primarily in the northern Great Plains region of the U.S., and then also more generally to study dynamic earth processes around the world, such as melting glaciers, ecosystem responses to seasonal changes and human impacts, and uh, natural disasters. Once Williams had the laptop back up and running, uh, the team here on the ground was able to get it set up to photograph areas in Russia and Argentina today. And Hoshini also took part in the circadian rhythms and procate dietary study, the former looks at how living through 16 sunrises and sunsets a day affects astronauts, and the latter studies whether diet can be used to counter bone loss and microgravity. In addition to all this, on the Russian side of the station, Sergey Revin also found time to work on the Siner experiment, which works to identify current bioproductive areas in the world's ocean. It's been a busy day and a busy week for the crew on board the International Space Station with lots of interesting work going on. 
Welcome back to Mission Control Houston. We've been talking a lot this week about the preparations that have been going on for the upcoming spacewalk, which is pretty much now upon us on Monday at 9.40 a.m. Central Time. Uh, Yuri Malenchenko and uh, Gennady Padok are going to be going out for the Russian EVA 31. And here to tell us a little bit more about that, we have uh, with us Art Thomason. He's an EVA or spacewalk officer, and he's going to go over some of the tasks for that. Good morning. Uh, yeah, on Russian EVA 31, there's going to be three primary tasks. Uh, the first of those tasks is going to be to relocate a uh, Strela uh, from the DC-1 or the docking compartment 1 over to FGB. Uh, the reason they're doing this is um, DC-1 is eventually going to be replaced by a new module, so they're you know, getting this Strela off of there. Uh, so they'll get that moved over to the FGB. Uh, from there, uh, they'll, um, they'll head out to do a satellite deploy. And so that's actually a 20-pound steel ball that they're going to deploy from station or, or jettison, if you will. And uh, from that, they'll, they'll use that to verify math models uh, at how things deorbit back into Earth. Uh, from there, their final task is they're going to be installing uh, some, some protective shields on the outside of station. And so we have a video here that shows a little bit about what they're going to be doing on the EVA. Uh, you can see they'll come out of their airlock and then get right to work on the Strela. Now this is actually the Strela that they're going to be moving during the EVA. Uh, they'll extend EV2 um, out to uh, Strela 1 and then retract it. And the Strelas are basically booms, kind of yes. like our robotic arms, uh, but not as, not as... Similar to our robotic arms. Um, however, these, these are actually man-powered, so there's, uh, you know, they crank with their hands to extend it and, and move it. So. Uh, less overhead in operating it. And they're just moving that out of the way so that they can eventually get uh, take the peers off the station and, and replace it. That's correct. And so that's what you're seeing here in this video. So uh, they obviously they have uh, two strellas here. So they're extending one of the strellas and to capture the one that they're going to be removing. So it shows it here, uh, capturing that one. And then you'll see in just a moment uh, they'll actually move it over uh, back to the FGB. So here you see EV2 coming down. They're going to be working together to capture the Strela to be moved. Uh, once it's secure, then they'll, they'll move it back over to the FGB. Um, and since we've done this once before, is it you think it'll go pretty straightforward? And I think it'll be pretty straightforward. Um, both of these crew members have a lot of EVA experience, so I don't expect it to be a problem for them. OK. And then I guess. You know, whenever they have anything to deploy, that's always that always seems interesting to me. Um, it is, yeah, and especially in this case, um, it, it's pretty neat because you know, I think it, people are always interested in, in how things deorbit. You know, there's um, you know small amounts of air, things like that, that are going to slow it down. So when you have a, a steel ball like this, it doesn't really matter their orientation. A lot of the things um, that we've that we've jettisoned before, things like MLI, which is you know a thermal blanket. Um, which those things, it really makes a difference on how it's oriented in space. So this, it does, the orientation doesn't matter as much. Just like pitching a baseball or? Similar to that, they actually have a, a contraption that's going to release it so that it's more a, a controlled release. Okay. And uh, it's, it's to let the um, teams on the ground practice tracking, is that? Th that's right. So they'll track it and um, it, it's going to be used to verify models and just better understand how things deorbit. Okay. So here you can see they're still at work on um, stowing that Strela or relocating it. Uh, once they get it back into place on the FGB, they, they stow it so that um, it's out of the way. And for there, they translate back down the Strela. So you can see this is a telescoping piece of equipment that they can extend and retract by hand. So here you see Gennady riding back on, on the tip. Uh, they'll put this one back in place, uh, Strela 1 and they'll secure that back to structure. Now here's a, you'll see this object flashing here is an external experiment. Uh, they're going to close that up. It's about the size of a, a laptop, if you will. Um, so they'll, they'll close that up and uh, bring it back inside. It's technically a get ahead, so they'll, they'll get it closed here and then I guess we'll see how time's going on the EVA and potentially bring it in. Since it's right there, uh, you know, it's a, a get ahead of opportunity, if you will. Sure. And the spacewalk's scheduled to last about six and a half hours? That's correct. Here's I, the satellite. That that's correct. Yeah, you see the spherical satellite. Um, as, as I mentioned, it was a 20-pound ball, so it's a you know pretty pretty heavy thing um, when you have gravity. Uh, it's 21 inches in diameter. Looks a little like a bowling ball. Yeah, and so like 
some of the things that I mentioned earlier, thermal blankets that we've let go of before, then they don't have much mass, so they slow down quicker. This is um, a heavier object, so I think they're able to characterize um, you know, how it deorbits a little bit better using something like this. Okay. And I think the metallic portion of it, too, makes it easier to track. Sure, that makes sense. So we saw the we saw that satellite get deployed, and then here uh, some uh, video on their final task. Uh, this is going to be installing a few protective shields. Uh, these shields protect from uh, micrometeorite debris on the outside of station. So they're, they're going to be in installing these on the service module. You can see those being put into place right here. And I know we kind of replace things like that fairly often, right? Is it just to make sure the station has the best protection possible? Or? That, that's correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, here you can see one of the other experiments uh, called BioRisk uh, that they're potentially bringing inside. Now, this is a get-ahead task. Um, so this experiment, they get to bring it inside and uh, find out uh, you know, scientific data that they collected uh, during the course of the experiment. Uh, the final get-ahead here is to put struts on the ladder on the outside of docking compartment one, just to stiffen that up. Uh, eventually, when docking compartment one is replaced, they'll then uh, install, uh, they'll, they'll move that ladder over. And that's a ladder that's used by spacewalkers when they're out that's doing correct. these sorts of tasks. Yeah, so right when they come out of the airlock, they climb out on that ladder. Okay. All right. Well, so, you know, this being a, a Russian spacewalk, how much does the U.S. flight control team here in Houston get involved? Uh, for this one, it, we're definitely not involved in the same level we are for U.S. spacewalk. A U.S. spacewalk, we do the training on the ground, we write the procedures, and then when the crew is, is performing the task, we're walking them through step by step and helping them with any problems that they run into. Uh, for the Russian EVA, uh, they are borrowing a few of our U.S. tools. Uh, one of those is the wireless video system, uh, so it's basically a video camera that's mounted to the crew's helmet. Uh, so for that, now you'll get to see the point of view of the crew member and watch them work, see what they're seeing. Uh, so they're borrowing that tool. They're also borrowing a few tethers that we have. Okay. Uh, so we're involved with getting those over to them, making sure they're configured correctly for them. Um, we're also following along for the spacewalk. Um, so you know, we we definitely don't have control of what's going on, but we're watching and um, for our hard for our U.S. systems as well as things that are going to affect the wireless video system, where we make sure that all the proper inhibits are in place, things are powered down, things that may interfere with the wireless video system. Um, so you know, we are involved, but on in a much smaller scale. Well, I know NASA TV viewers are always glad to know that there's going to be helmet camera views. Yes. Okay. Well, and I know they've been spending pretty much all week getting ready for it, and we're even getting ready already for the U.S. spacewalk that's coming up at the end of the month. Um, I think today, though, they were they were trying on their Orlons, making just doing some final checks and, and making sure they were fitting right and everything. Yeah, that's correct. Um, it's kind of a dress rehearsal, if you will, making sure that the suit um, fits correctly. Um, they can make last-minute adjustments, so they don't have to take the time to do that on the day of the spacewalk. Um, they get to translate around a little bit inside their airlock to make sure that. Um, they're comfortable in the suit, get a little bit of practice before the real day. Okay. So I think everything's gone smoothly so far in all the preparations. Though, yes. So we should be ready to go on Monday, 9.40 a.m. Central Time. That's correct. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming and talking with us about it. We'll be watching on Monday. Well, thank you. It is great to talk to all of you, and I just want you to know that we could not be more excited. At the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, the Mars Curiosity Flight Control Team took a few minutes from tending to NASA's newest Red Planet rover to receive a special congratulatory phone call from President Barack Obama, who was aboard Air Force One. What you accomplished embodies the American spirit, and your passion and your commitment is making a difference. And your hard work uh, is now paying dividends because uh, my, our expectation is that uh, Curiosity is going to be uh, telling us things that uh, we did not know before and laying the groundwork for uh, an even more audacious undertaking in the future, and that's a human mission to the Red Planet. JPL Director Charles Alachi thanked the President for his praise and echoed the Commander-in-Chief's hope that the excitement generated by the mission would help inspire a sense of exploration among younger generations. On behalf of all of us at NASA, we thank you for taking the time to give us a call, and hopefully we inspire some of the millions of young people who were watching this landing. The president also emphasized that this mission is an international effort, offering gratitude to several of the countries 
that have contributed science instruments and expertise to aid Curiosity's quest for evidence of microbial life on Mars. Spain, Russia, Germany, France, Canada, Italy, Japan, Australia, all of them contributed, I know, to the instrumentation Curiosity landed uh, on Martian surface. The rover team continues to transition Curiosity to a state of readiness for roving the Martian surface. Here's a quick report from JPL on what's been happening since Curiosity's landing. Hi, I'm Bobak Ferdosi, Flight Director with the Mars Science Lab Curiosity, and this is your Curiosity rover update. This week we did a color panorama surrounding the rover with both the mass cam and the nav cams. And we also upgraded the software on board both computers of the rover this week. The new software is like having new applications with new functionalities on the rover, allow us to do mobility, deploy the arm, and get to the science that we've been looking forward to on the mission. And we also did a series of instrument checkouts. Those included the ChemCam instrument, the ChemIn instrument, Rad Science, REMS, APXS, SAM, and the additional cameras on the rover, including the Molly instrument. Uh, we also downlinked some MARTI high-resolution data images. Those are from the Descent Imager. Coming up this week, we'll be using the ChemCam to zap targets for the first time. We'll also be deploying the arm. And we'll be checking out the mobility system by doing a, what's called a rover bump, or a short drive. Astronomers have found an extraordinary galaxy cluster, one of the largest objects in the universe, that is breaking several important cosmic records. Observations of the Phoenix Cluster located about 5.7 billion light years from Earth with NASA's Chandra X-ray Observatory, the National Science Foundation's South Pole Telescope, and eight other world-class observatories may force astronomers to rethink how these colossal structures and the galaxies that inhabit them evolve. Stars are forming in the Phoenix Cluster at the highest rate ever observed for the middle of a galaxy cluster. The object also is the most powerful producer of X-rays of any known cluster and among the most massive. The data also suggests the rate of hot gas cooling in the central regions of the cluster is the largest ever observed. Because of their tremendous size, galaxy clusters are crucial objects for studying cosmology and galaxy evolution, so finding one with such extreme properties like the Phoenix Cluster is important. While NASA's teams have been taking a close look at how Orion's parachutes behave as the 20,000-pound spacecraft descends through the sky, they've also been investigating another challenge. How do you recover parachutes that are 100 feet wide from the water? NASA's Neutral Buoyancy Laboratory at the Johnson Space Center in Houston was the setting as these teams took some of Orion's drogue and main parachutes and dunked them in the water. They were noting how long the chute stayed afloat and the best ways to get them out of the water and into a boat. Each one of the main chutes weighs close to 300 pounds. The water doubles that weight. So testing ways of handling them and doing it safely is important. We learn every time we do a parachute test of, of something, uh, we find ways to improve the parachute design so that when we finally fly the parachute system for human spaceflight, it's a safe and reliable system. The Orion team was joined by members of the United States Navy, as well as the recovery forces that will work Exploration Flight Test 1, Orion's first unmanned test flight scheduled for 2014. That flight will send Orion more than 3,600 miles into space, reaching speeds of more than 20,000 miles per hour, and returning for a splashdown in the Pacific Ocean. This recovery testing on Orion's parachutes and the capsule itself will continue during the lead up to EFT-1. Orion also has more drop tests planned at the Langley Research Center and parachute tests at the U.S. Army Yuma Proving Grounds later this month. A decade, we believe, will be one of discovery and of one of new and innovative approaches and tools, things that we will develop. The National Research Council has released its second decadal survey in solar and space physics, or heliophysics. The broad-based assessment identifies the highest scientific priorities of the U.S. solar and space physics research enterprise for the next 10 years. It's truly national in scope. It's really intended to talk about NASA, NSF, NOAA, DOD, all the investments that are being made in solar and space physics in various ways. 
Requested by NASA and the National Science Foundation, this decadal survey follows the NRC's previous survey in solar and space physics. An upcoming mission to study the development of Atlantic hurricanes using unmanned aerial vehicles based at the NASA Wallops Flight Facility was discussed during a public presentation at the facility's visitor center. The Hurricane and Severe Storm Sentinel, HS3, is a five-year mission specifically targeted to investigate the processes that underlie hurricane formation and intensity change in the Atlantic Ocean Basin. If we understand more about the storms and we can predict that better, we can get people out of harm's way, we can not evacuate people when they don't need to evacuate, and we can you know, save human lives by making sure that everyone's informed and has the best information possible. HS3 will use two NASA Global Hawk unmanned aerial vehicles, one with an instrument suite geared toward measurement of the environment and the other with instruments suited to inner core structure and processes. The aircraft are capable of flight altitudes greater than 55,000 feet and flight durations of up to 30 hours. More than 200 people will be involved in preparing and supporting the aircraft, flight planning and aircraft coordination and conducting the science data collection. It's the volume of data that really makes it unique. And the scientists are all going to be working together and communicating and even showing real-time data during the mission to help them you know, understand what they're seeing and communicate during their, while they're doing their evaluation. And all this stuff is going to be fed into models that could help us better predict storms. In addition to the 2012 mission, the project will also be conducted from Wallops in 2013 and 2014, providing sustained measurements over several years due to the limited sampling opportunities in any given hurricane season. Smokey, welcome to NASA, welcome to the Johnson Space Center. Smokey Bear visited the Johnson Space Center to celebrate both his 68th birthday and a Space Act agreement between NASA and the U.S. Forest Service. JSC Deputy Director Ellen Ochoa, astronaut Mike Fossum, and others rolled out the red carpet for Smokey and members of both the U.S. and the Texas Forest Service, complete with a tour of mission control and birthday cake. Smokey also met Robonaut and its designers and made a special stop at the JSC Child Care Center to talk about fire prevention and to plant a tree to symbolize the partnership between NASA and the Forest Service. On August 20th, the Voyager 2 spacecraft chalks up another year of exploration. 35 years ago on that date, Voyager 2 launched from Cape Canaveral to explore Jupiter and Saturn. After a string of discoveries at those planets, the mission of Voyager 2 and its twin Voyager 1, launched less than a month later, was extended to the outer planets of Uranus and Neptune. The duo's current campaign, the Voyager Interstellar Mission, is helping NASA reach beyond the outer planets to the heliosheath, the outermost layer of the heliosphere, where the solar wind is slowed by the pressure of interstellar gas. This extended mission continues to characterize the outer solar system environment and search for the heliopause boundary the outer limits of the sun's magnetic field and outward flow of the solar wind. 25 years ago in 1987, the late Sally Ride, America's first woman in space, headed a group at NASA headquarters that completed an assessment of NASA's options beyond the space station. On August 17th of that year, NASA released that group's report, Leadership and America's Future in Space, which came to be known as the Ride Report. The document recommended major programs to study Earth scientists with powerful orbiting sensors and exploration of the solar system with new generations of robotic probes. City and uh, uh, you know all the excitement that happened last week when it finally uh, reached Earth. We're still getting some pretty awesome pictures of what's happening there. But I want to talk about Mars Curiosity and uh, what's happening here on Earth. I don't know if you've seen this already, but it's become a bit of a web sensation and it's been all over Twitter and all over social media. Check this out. This is what I see. Okay. Data streaming back from curiosity. I got stars on my hawk and I ain't afraid to show it, show it, show it, show it. We're NASA and we know it. <laughs> So anyway, it makes me kind of snap my fingers a little bit here, and no, I will not be dancing, but uh, this is a parody uh, of, uh, of course, uh, that other song, I'm section, you know it, and uh, uh, they are, of course, talking about the Mars uh, Curiosity team uh, that are, uh, of course, that were, became so famous when they were so excited to see it make landfall. What do you think? 
Mar, I love this viral video. You know, it's proof that NASA is the new sexy, but of course, it's something that you've known for years already, right? <laughs> yeah, we've been on this. We've been on this bandwagon for years, for years. Yeah, it's actually very cool, and everybody, everybody's been talking about how cool, how cool NASA seems yeah. now, especially after that. Uh, That's right. Mars landing. Mario Ramos, space hipster. You know, you knew <laughs> NASA was cool before everyone else, cool, right? That's right. I love you, Mari. <laughs> <See ya. laughs> Thank you. Take care. Have a great weekend. Now that question, it was put to the team during a live internet chat on Thursday. And the answer, probably the Morse code in the wheels. And there you see it, three lines that spell out J, P, and L, which stands for Jet Propulsion Lab. So as a Curiosity rover it roams the Martian soil at a breakneck speed of four centimeters an hour, it will leave a little shout out to its very cool makers. And that is Newsstream. But the news continues at CNN. World Business Today is next. Er ist ein Spätzünder in diesem Jahr, aber jetzt dreht der Sommer voll auf. Der miese Juli abgehakt, die schlechte Laune weggeschmolzen, alle zieht es heute ans oder besser ins Wasser. Und selbst im hohen Norden ist es schon fast heiß, aber sonst gut. Ja, Deutschland genießt die Hitze und da fallen auch in der Politik die Höhen heute kein Krawattenzwang. Solange die Leute mich nicht stören und ich gut drauf bin, habe ich damit gar kein Problem. Ich mache hier so eine quasi so eine Art Bürgersprechstunde am Strand. Glücklich, wer schon gestern am Strand war, denn die Anreise heute eine eher schweißtreibende Angelegenheit. Eine Ausweichrouten, dann stehe ich auf der Landstraße und am Trecker, das bringt mich auch nicht weiter. Nimmt man halt ein bisschen mehr zu trinken mit, ein bisschen was von unterwegs für die Kinder und dann geht das. Heiße Sahara-Luft aus Afrika hat uns heute Temperaturen bis zu 35 Grad beschert und morgen legt der Sommer noch eine Schippe drauf. Das bedeutet Schwerstarbeit für Herz und Kreislauf. Um den Körper abzukühlen, müssen sie bei Hitze 30 bis 40 Prozent mehr leisten. Schon heute verbuchten die Krankenhäuser mehr Notfallpatienten. Deshalb sollte man ein paar Hitzetipps beachten. Nicht in die pralle Sonne und wenn doch nur mit Kopfbedeckung. Körperliche Anstrengungen vermeiden, lieber eine Siesta einlegen. Möglichst leichtes Essen, wie Obst und Salate zu sich nehmen. Und das Wichtigste, viel trinken. Mindestens einen Liter über den Durst, aber keinen Alkohol oder Kaffee. Beim Schwitzen wird auch Salz ausgeschieden. Und dieses Salz sollte wieder zu sich genommen werden, meinetwegen im Mineralwasser oder auch äh, mit Brezeln und Ähnlichem. Feierlaune heute auch in den proppevollen Freibädern. Das heiße Wochenende spült den Betreibern endlich satte Einnahmen in die leeren Kassen. Ja, und wie heiß es morgen bei Ihnen wird, das sagen wir Ihnen im Internet auf rtl.de. Und da erfahren Sie auch, welcher Ort der heißeste in Deutschland ist. Dabei haben die spanischen Behörden offenbar Brandstifter als Ursache für die Feuer auf der Kanareninsel La Gomera ausgemacht. Zum Motiv heißt es, möglicherweise habe die Drogenmafia die Feuer in einem zum Weltnaturerbe gehörenden Nationalpark gelegt, um dadurch die Behörden abzulenken. Sonne pur von Kiel bis Konstanz, zu 28 bis 34, von Rosenheim bis Rügen. Das gab es noch nicht oft in diesem Sommer. Und die mehr als 36 Grad hier ganz im Westen sind ein deutlicher Fingerzeig, dass morgen was geht in Richtung 40 Grad. Dazu gleich mehr. Jetzt genießen wir einfach mal ein paar Bilder dieses Traubentages, beginnend beim Sonnenaufgang über Rügen, gedreht kurz nach 6 Uhr. Etwas später und garniert mit ein paar Schleierwolken die Morgenstimmung über dem Ruhrgebiet. Tagsüber war es am und im Wasser natürlich am schönsten. Die zweite Fluchtmöglichkeit vor der großen Hitze sehen wir hier, wobei es selbst auf den Alpengipfeln außergewöhnlich warm ist. In 2500 Meter immer noch fast 20 Grad. In Mittel- und Südfrankreich gab es heute schon 40 Grad und diese Luft kommt morgen mit Süd- bis Südwestwinden zu uns. Auch der Montag noch fast überall heiß. Nur von der Küste her wird es allmählich etwas kühler und mit Drehung der Strömung auf West wird die große Hitze dann immer mehr nach Süden abgedrängt. Die kommenden Stunden ein Sommernachts-Grillraum. Klar, leichter Südwind, lange warm. In den Ballungsräumen im Westen eine tropische Nacht mit nicht unter 20 Grad. Morgen neuerlich strahlen, schön der Himmel oft wieder wolkenlos. Nur im Nordwesten können sich später ganz lokal einzelne Gewitter bilden. Dazu der heißeste Tag des Jahres mit 31 bis 38, westlich des Rheins, örtlich bis 40 und damit am Allzeitrekord dran. Auch der Montag noch sehr heiß, dazu aus Norden ein paar Gewitter, lokal auch heftig. Ab Dienstag steigt das Gewitterrisiko überall und die Temperaturen gehen langsam runter. Erstmal aber gilt, der Sommer bleibt. Also wirklich heute in Nordrhein-Westfalen. 
Es war heute schon also ein absolut hochsommerlicher Tag mit Temperaturen von örtlich mehr als 36 Grad. Dazu komme ich gleich. Aber ich fange an mit der Ankündigung, um die es geht. Morgen wird es noch heißer. Es kommen jetzt die heißesten Tage. Morgen wird der heißeste Tag des ganzen Jahres und ja, die heißeste Zone in ganz Deutschland wird Nordrhein-Westfalen sein. Und vielleicht knacken wir morgen in Nordrhein-Westfalen auch den alten Temperaturrekord aus Deutschland aus dem Jahre 2003. Diese 40,3 Grad wurden damals im Saarland gemessen. In Perl nenne ich an der Mosel. Es könnte sein, dass wir morgen in NRW, wie gesagt, diese Werte um 40, ein bisschen schaffen. Die Höchsttemperaturen des heutigen Tages. 36,4 Grad in Düren, verbreitet mehr als 35 Grad. Das war ja heute schon richtig heiß. Aber die Luft, die uns in den nächsten 24 Stunden erreicht, ist noch einmal um 5 Grad wärmer. Deshalb sind morgen durchaus diese 40 Grad oder ein bisschen mehr als 40 Grad möglich. Wie tropisch die Luftmasse ist, soll diese schöne Zeichnung einmal verdeutlichen. Der Kilimanjaro im tropischen Afrika in Tansania. Die Null-Grad-Grenze liegt dort heute bei rund 4.400 Metern. Das ist dort ein ziemlich typischer Wert. Die Null-Grad-Grenze in Nordrhein-Westfalen liegt morgen bei 4.500 Metern. Wir bekommen also wirklich ja, tropische Luft vom Feinsten. Heute Nacht können wir auf jeden Fall noch einmal die Fenster aufreißen. Es ist sternklar. Meistens, zumindest nur ganz vereinzelt, gibt es ein paar harmlose Wolken. Die Temperaturen allerdings in den Innenstädten. Schon auch schon tropisch, mehr als 20 Grad, 20 bis 22 Grad am Rhein entlang und in den Innenstädten auch übrigens auf dem kahlen Asten, auf den Höhen, wo die warme Luft ankommt, 20 Grad als Tiefstemperatur. Aber in den Tälern, wie zum Beispiel in Siegen, kühlt es dann doch auf bis zu 12 Grad ab. Morgen Vormittag Sonne vom Feinsten, Nachmittag Sonne vom Feinsten. Ja und jetzt zu den Temperaturen. Die erreichen nämlich vor allem am Rhein und auch westlich davon diese angesagten 40 Grad. Und morgen sind wir schlauer, ob es einen neuen Temperaturrekord geben wird. Verbreitet sind es ansonsten 38 bis 40 Grad. Der Wind weht dazu eher schwach bis mäßig aus südöstlichen Richtungen mit Stärke 3 bis 4. In den nächsten Tagen, am Montag, kommen am Montag, Nachmittagabend, einzelne Gewitter heran. Temperaturen noch immer bis 32 Grad. Es wird wahrscheinlich sogar eine Spur schwüler noch als die 40 Grad. Und dann kommt aber Stück für Stück etwas angenehmere Luft. Der Dienstag bringt dann immer noch 26 bis 30 Grad. Wir bleiben also weiterhin im sommerlichen Bereich, aber nicht mehr in diesem fast nicht mehr auszuhaltenden sommerlichen Bereich. Und es wird also morgen hier noch einmal zusammengefasst sehr, sehr heiß. Und ich glaube, die meisten Leute, Leute sollten bei diesen Temperaturen dann doch eher drin bleiben. Zurück zu dir, Martin. Wir werden das auf jeden Fall tun. Neben Dank, Carsten Schwanke und schon jetzt der Hinweis, umfassende Berichte über diesen Mega-Hitzetag morgen, die gibt es natürlich bei uns hier in der Aktuellen Stunde morgen ab 19.10 Uhr. Ja, es war definitiv der heißeste Tag des Jahres und beinahe wäre sogar der Allzeit-Hitze-Rekord geknackt worden. Die höchste Temperatur wurde mit 39,2 Grad im rheinland-pfälzischen Göllheim gemessen. Ausgerechnet an diesem schweißtreibenden Sommertag hat Kanzlerin Angela Merkel die Bürger ins Kanzleramt geladen und die Menschen kamen zu Hauf. Frank Kaspers und Friede Gutmann berichten. Willkommen in der Sauna im Berliner Kanzleramt. Trotz Affenhitze auf den Blazer hat die Hausherrin beim Dampfbad in der Menge dann doch nicht verzichtet. Sie freue sich, dass die Gäste hier seien und nicht im Schwimmbad, sagte sie gut gelaunt. Schauen Sie sich gut um und ähm, genießen Sie ein bisschen auch das schöne Wetter. Wir haben da hinten ja auch einen ganz hübschen Park. Dabei stand Berlin noch nicht mal an der Hitzespitze. Der Glutofen Deutschland heizte sich am meisten im Westen auf, wie die Fieberkurve in Köln zeigt. Nachts um eins hatte es immer noch 25 Grad. Der absolute Tiefstwert wurde morgens um sechs mit 22 Grad erreicht. Doch schon kurz vor elf war die 30 Grad Marke wieder geknackt. Und gegen 17 Uhr lief das Thermometer zur Höchstform auf mit beinahe 40 Grad. Ob das noch angenehm ist, kommt auf den Blickwinkel an. Hölle. Ist die reine Hölle. Alle wünschen sich den Sommer, wenn es regnet, jetzt ist er da. Also sollte man nicht meckern, sondern einfach genießen. Wir sind kurz vorm Schlaganfall. Selbst der sonst heißeste Punkt an der Mosel musste sich heute geschlagen geben. Der Hotspot in Deutschland, diese Wetterstation hier hinter mir in Braunenberg an der Mosel. Der Hitzerekord für Deutschland wurde hier am 11. August 1998 festgestellt. 41,2 Grad waren es damals hier. Und auch heute haben wir wieder stolze 33 Grad. 
Wer schlau war, übte sich als Gipfelstürme, denn in den Bergen ist es nicht nur kühler, auch der Weitblick war heute unübertroffen, besonders aus der Vogelperspektive. Ich bin ein bisschen nervös, muss ich sagen, aber es passt. Ich freue mich, wenn ich in der Luft bin. Jetzt klingt mal. Und wer erstmal über seinen Angstschatten gesprungen ist, wurde mit frischem Gegenwind und grandioser Aussicht belohnt. 40 oder nicht 40, das war heute die Frage. Die genaue Antwort gibt es erst nach 20 Uhr, wenn alle Stationen ihren Höchstwert melden. Fest steht aber schon jetzt, selten war ein Tag deutschlandweit so bullenheiß. Oft 35 bis rauf zur Küste, knapp 39 im Kölner Umland und 39,2 in Rheinland-Pfalz. Und hinter mir sehen Sie das Bild des Tages. Über den aufgeheizten Böden flimmert es bis zum Abwinken. Während sich Dunkelflächen auf 60 Grad und mehr aufheizen konnten, lag die Temperatur 5 cm über dem Boden bei knapp 50. Die Luft Darüber bei knapp 40 Grad. Und durch die dichte Unterschiede entsteht dieses Flimmern samt Luftspiegelungen. Dass die Luft zumindest in höheren Schichten eindeutig mit in Sahara war, zeigt die Kölner Wettercam am Horizont milchig weiß durch Sand und Staub. Morgen wird es dann im Osten noch mal extrem heiß. Ehe sich aus Nordwesten langsam etwas kühlere Luft durchsetzt. Südlich der Mittelgebirge geht bei Schwülen knapp 30 das große Schwitzen noch weiter. Im Norden wird es deutlich angenehmer und schlaftauglicher. Nach dem heißesten Tag des Jahres kommt jetzt die wärmste Nacht. Teilweise geht es nicht unter 25 Grad, später im Nordwesten einzelne Gewitter. Morgen Montag ein Dakapo der Hitze mit Sonne satt im Süden und Osten. Sonst schon mehr Wolken und einige Schauer und Gewitter, die sich nachmittags und abends dann auch auf die Mittelgebirge ausbreiten. In der Lausitz noch mal bis 38 Grad, im Norden und Westen weniger heiß, dafür aber recht schwül. Ab Dienstag häufiger Gewitter und auch im Süden weniger heiß. Auf einen langen, heißen Sommertag in Deutschland. Kurz nach sechs geht über der Kieler Förde die Sonne auf. Und dann steigt das Thermometer rasch auf 35, 37, 39 Grad. Es ist Wüstenluft, die aus Afrika zu uns kommt. Und die schafft solche Bilder. Riesiger Andrang auf die Freibäder und Badeseen, schier endlose Warteschlangen vor den Kassenhäuschen. Und dann im Wasser kaum noch ein Stehplatz frei. Schön, wenn es im Sommer öfter mal so gewesen wäre und nicht nur am vorletzten Augustwochenende. Also vor vielen Jahren war es öfters einmal so voll, aber heute rechnen wir, dass über 10.000 kommen ne, und das war es schon lange nicht mehr. Ne. Gestern haben wir 9.000 gehabt. Rettungskräfte und Notaufnahmen waren in Alarmbereitschaft, aber es blieb ruhig. Die meisten haben sich in der Hitze wohl richtig verhalten genügend trinken. Also man, wenn man das gibt eine ganz einfache Regel, wenn ich alle vier Stunden auf die Toilette gehen muss, dann habe ich genügend getrunken, dann ist mein, mein Körper im Gleichgewicht von der Flüssigkeit her. Vor allem den Großstädtern im Westen steht eine weitere tropisch heiße Nacht bevor. Tag 3 heute der großen Hitze und damit auch fast der letzte Tag. Das Förderband aus der Sahara mit der extrem heißen Luft funktionierte nur noch im Osten und Süden so richtig. Hier örtlich wieder 39 Grad. Von Westen drängte weniger heiße, dafür umso schwülere Luft nach und löste einige teils kräftige Gewitter aus, die in den nächsten Stunden nach Osten ausgreifen und weiterhin großen Hagel- und orkanartige Böden bringen können. Der Süden genießt derweil Hochsommer pur. Keine Quellwolke liegt seit gestern über dem türkisen Alpensee. Und bei Temperaturen über 30 Grad gibt es Spaß pur, wenn sich der Nachfolger von Parzern ins Wasser katapultiert. Und als besonderes Leckerli hatten die Bayern auch nachts Glück, weil die Luft in den Tälern ziemlich stark auskühlte. Noch versteckt sich die Sonne hinter den Wolken, aber das macht nichts. Hier in Schabolz an der Ostsee ist es wieder richtig schön. Bei erfrischenden 20 Grad Wassertemperatur und 25 Grad im Schatten am Vormittag. Alle sind zufrieden, sogar der Bademeister. Wir machen das ehrenamtlich und wir bekommen dafür kein Geld. Und deswegen freuen wir uns natürlich, wenn wir unseren Urlaub, den wir dafür ähm, nutzen, um hier die Sicherheit am Strand zu gewährleisten, freuen wir uns natürlich, wenn da auch natürlich viel Sonne ist, dass wir auch mal ja, unseren Urlaub genießen können. Zwar ist es nicht mehr ganz so heiß wie am Sonntag, aber warm genug für die Urlauber das perfekte Ferienwetter. Gefällt mir. Na, schön warm, kann man schön baden gehen mit den Kindern. Ja, wunderbar. Sehr, heute angenehmer als gestern, weil gestern war so heiß, dass es schon nicht mehr zum Aushalten war. Ja, am Wochenende hat die Hitze aus der Sahara ganz Deutschland überrollt. Am heißesten war es mit 39,2 Grad im rheinland-pfälzischen Gölheim. Ob Nord, Süd, West oder Ost, das Motto hieß, Hauptsache abkühlen. Nicht alle verkrafteten die Sahara-Hitze so gut wie diese Badegäste. 
In der Notaufnahme der Hamburger Asklepios Klinik ging es turbulent zu. Gleich ein paar Dutzend Hitzepatienten wurden eingeliefert mit ganz unterschiedlichen Beschwerden. Zum einen allgemeine Schwäche, Durstgefühl, Erschöpfung, Kreislaufprobleme. Kann auch mal sein, dass man plötzlich bewusstlos wird. Das nennt man dann Synkope. Das sind so die wesentlichen Beschwerden. Bis zur Wochenmitte bleibt es schwül warm. Allerdings kann es dann am Himmel schon mal krachen. Aber Gewitter haben auch was Gutes. Sie bringen schließlich Abkühlung. Das Wetter lässt die Temperaturen in die Höhe schießen und bescherte uns gestern den wärmsten Tag des Jahres. Spitzenreiter waren Saarbrücken und Bad Kreuznach mit 38,9 Grad. Aber auch in anderen Städten gab es Temperaturrekorde. In Münster beispielsweise war es mit 37,5 Grad so heiß wie noch nie. Und auch nachts kühlte es kaum ab. In Wernigerode waren es da noch immer 30 Grad. Über die Hitzewelle berichtet Antje Kansock. So sieht echter Sommer aus. In Dresden, wie der Hälfte aller Bundesländer, sind noch Ferien. Ab ins Freibad oder irgendwie ins Wasser. Jede Abkühlung ist willkommen. Ich esse gerade ein Schokoeis. Und hilft das gegen die Hitze? <lacht> Weniger vergnüglich. Straße fegen bei fast 35 Grad. Da geht heute alles etwas langsamer. Doch auf dem Bau müssen Termine eingehalten werden. Im Büro geht die Arbeit auch ganz normal weiter. Und auf einen pünktlichen Bus warten Fahrgäste. Gegen zu viel Hitze bei der Arbeit hilft nur eins. Viel trinken. Viel trinken. Viel trinken. Viel zu trinken und vor allem viel Geduld brauchen Bahnreisende bei diesen Temperaturen. Die Klimaanlagen in einigen ICEs und ICs streiken seit dem Wochenende wieder. Zugausfälle und Verspätungen bis in den Montagnachmittag hinein. Angestrengt ist auch die Situation an der Elbe. Viel zu wenig Wasser für die Flussschiffer. Wer noch fährt, hat kaum ein Drittel der üblichen Ladung an Bord. Richtig viel Wasser dagegen bekam Schwerin ab. Erste Hitzegewitter fluteten am Morgen die Straßen. Eine kurze Abkühlung, denn noch bis Ende der Woche kann Deutschland, wie hier in Magdeburg, den Hochsommer genießen. Abgeliefert hat, ich meine fast 39 Grad. Vielleicht war es ja, wenn ein Sommer ein Gewissen haben kann, dann müsste es ein schlechtes sein für diesen Sommer, denn der glänzte ja bis dahin durch Formschwäche. Ja, gestern war er jedenfalls in Topform. Heute im Vergleich dazu war es ja fast angenehm kühl. Aber zu einem Freibadbesuch hat es doch immer noch gereicht. Das hier ist in Gaderbaum in Bielefeld. Alle wollen nur eins, klar, ins Wasser. Heiß genug war es auch an diesem Tag. Ja, und besonders schön in Bielefeld, da war es zwar den ganzen Tag schwül, aber eben auch richtig sonnig. Nirgendwo Regen in Sicht. Da hat es dann auch dieser Mittag auf rund 30 Grad gebracht. Ja. Wie können wir Ihnen da helfen, haben wir überlegt. Wie können wir Ihnen ein bisschen Abkühlung verschaffen? Kalte Getränke können wir Ihnen ja nicht durchreichen durch den Fernseher in Ihr Wohnzimmer. Aber wir hatten da eine andere Idee. Ja, und da wird Ihnen vielleicht schon vom Zugucken ein bisschen kühler. Schauen Sie mal. Diese Bilder sind nur etwas über ein halbes Jahr her. So sah es in den ersten Februarwochen in Nordrhein-Westfalen aus. Ja, eindeutig kalt. Das Russlandhof Cooper hatte da sibirische Kälte ins Land gebracht. Überall freuen die Kanäle zu und Eisbrecher mussten ran, um die Eisdecke zu knacken und die Kanäle wieder frei für die Schifffahrt zu machen. Ich finde, man spürt jetzt schon förmlich so die Abkühlung so. Äh, im Raum. Im Februar fanden wir das ziemlich doof, erinnere mich noch gut dran. Jetzt bei diesen Sahara-Temperaturen fühlt sich das doch wieder ganz anders ja, an. Verständlich, bei 38,8 Grad Höchsttemperatur gestern in Pulheim. Diesen Rekordwert für den heißesten Tag dieses Jahres haben wir ja hier offiziell verkündet, Martin vor allen Dingen. Und offiziell bestätigt von Carsten Schwanke, aber viele von Ihnen wollten das nicht so recht glauben. Ja, viele haben angerufen und haben gesagt, das ist Quatsch, ich habe auch ein Thermometer, bei mir war es viel wärmer, ich habe bei mir im Garten gemessen, da lag es über 40 Grad. Naja, aber wie so vieles ist auch das Messen von Temperaturhöchstwerten in diesem Land eindeutig geregelt. Da kann man nicht einfach so messen, wie man will. Rekordwert 38,8 Grad. Lächerlich, sagt Thorsten Huben, Bademeister im Wissler Seebad am Niederrhein. Er hat gestern, im Schatten neben seinem Häuschen, höhere Temperaturen gemessen. Viel höhere. Also ich habe gestern um 14 Uhr hier eine Messung durchgeführt. Mein Thermometer hat dann äh, 44 Grad angezeigt. Das ist das Beweisfoto. Nun ist das Ding vielleicht nicht so genau. Aufgrund dessen, dass das ein Infrarotmessgerät ist, müssen wir natürlich eine Toleranz abziehen. Somit kommen wir auf eine Temperatur von 41 Grad hier. Diesen Rekord hat er den Badegästen gleich über Mikrofon mitgeteilt und konnte gar nicht glauben, als er abends hörte, Poolheim soll der heißeste Ort gewesen sein. 
Also ich habe geschmunzelt, weil irgendwie habe ich hier den ganzen Tag in der Sonne gestanden und gebraten bei 41 Grad. Also das kann nicht der heißeste Ort gewesen sein. Sondern der war hier. Richtig. <lacht> So wie ihm ging es gestern vielen Zuschauern. Über Facebook meldeten sie ihre Rekorde. Ich sage nur bei uns in Krefeld Hüls, 41 Grad im Schatten. Draußen im Schatten sind es 40,5 Grad, 39,5 Grad in Gladbeck. Nein, sagt Jürgen Weiß, Meteorologe beim Wetterdienst Meteomedia, all diese Werte seien eben leider nicht ganz richtig. Ein bisschen Schatten genüge nicht für eine exakte Messung. Wenn man einfach nur sein Gerät in den Schatten stellt, kommt natürlich noch Strahlung von der Seite heran. Also diffuse Strahlung nennen wir das. Das ist ähm, so gestreutes Licht. Das äh, verfälscht den Messwert auch, weil eben das Thermometer an sich dann erwärmt wird und nicht mehr die Lufttemperatur gemessen wird. Wenn ich das vermeiden will, muss ich also nach internationalen Richtlinien strahlungsgeschützt, so nennen wir das, messen. Und das geht eigentlich nur mit professionellen Messstationen. Vorgeschrieben ist... Ein belüftetes Gehäuse mit einem Temperatursensor. Es muss mindestens zwei Meter über dem Boden montiert werden. Darunter soll kurzgeschnittener Rasen sein. Und der Mindestabstand zu Häusern, Bäumen, also alles, was Hitze abstrahlen kann, muss mindestens zehn Meter betragen. Durch diesen Strahlungsschutz wird auf jeden Fall sichergestellt, dass man tatsächlich die Lufttemperatur erfasst und nicht irgendeine Temperatur der Oberfläche des Thermometers oder der Flüssigkeit oder des elektronischen Bauteils. Na gut, so professionell konnte Thorsten Huben gestern natürlich nicht messen. Aber eins kann er beschwören, es war wirklich sehr heiß hier. Man musste versuchen, sich abzukühlen. Ich bin auch mal unter die Dusche gegangen. Also es war wirklich unerträglich hier in der Sonne gestern. Heute ist es ja zum Glück nicht mehr ganz so schlimm. Da fällt ihm die Arbeit in seinem Freibad schon wieder viel leichter. So, ich hoffe, wir hätten damit alle Fragen geklärt und hoffentlich auch zur Zufriedenheit unseres Experten Carsten Schwanke alles beantwortet. Und du könntest uns ja jetzt aufklären, was das Wetter heute und auch die nächsten Tage so macht. Das mache ich gern. Also auf jeden Fall ist es wirklich so, dass ein äh, Thermometer in der Hand gehalten, neben der Hütte, äh, neben so einer Bademeisterhütte, das stimmt nicht so ganz. Aber in den Thermometer-Messgeräten, die die offiziellen Stationen so bieten, haben wir auch heute wieder hochformalige Temperaturen gemessen. Das hier sind die Höchstwerte des heutigen Tages, immer noch über 30 Grad in Bielefeld, in Münster, in Duisburg, in Köln und auch in Medebach. 33 Grad gab es sogar in Beverungen an der Weser. Also auch heute noch einmal heiß, aber dazu kam etwas anderes. Ich meine, das sind ja ungefähr so 7, 8 Grad weniger als gestern. Aber das hier sind die Bilder des Regenradars. Hier und da, vor allem im Süden Nordrhein-Westfalens, konnten heute sogar ein paar Tropfen den Boden erreichen. Aber die meisten Flecken, die wir hier sehen, das ist Regen, der durch die Atmosphäre fiel. Und weil die Luft so heiß ist, ist dieser Regen verdunstet. Als Folge haben wir zurzeit draußen eine sehr schwüle, eine drückend schwüle Luft. Das ist nicht gerade angenehm und deshalb wird es auch in der Nacht relativ warm bleiben. Dazu kommen noch viele Wolken. Wir sehen es hier auf den Satellitenbildern. Was wir auch sehen im Süden Deutschlands, hier über Bayern, Baden-Württemberg, da gab es dicke große Gewitterwolken. Bei uns hingegen gibt es hier über Belgien Richtung Frankreich noch einzelne Wolken, die zu uns kommen. Das heißt also, in der Nacht kann es durchaus noch den ein oder anderen Regenschauer ein kurzes Gewitter geben, aber nichts, was wirklich zu einer markanten Abkühlung beiträgt. Die Temperaturen. Wir sinken bis zum Morgen dann aber doch auf Werte knapp unter 20 Grad. Vielleicht haben wir in den Innenstädten 19 bis 20 Grad. Morgen Vormittag dann startet der Tag recht freundlich mit Sonnenschein. Im Verlauf des Tages werden sich aber morgen vor allem am Nachmittag und zum Abend hin häufiger Schauer und auch zum Teil kräftige Gewitter bilden. Und ich sage es auch jetzt schon, vor allem in der Nacht von morgen Dienstag auf übermorgen Mittwoch wird es zum Teil kräftigere Regengüsse und auch Gewitter geben, die dann einen Luftmassenwechsel hervorrufen. Die Temperaturen morgen, wir sehen es auch morgen, noch einmal sommerliche Werte, 26 bis 28 Grad in der Kölner Bucht, noch einmal bis zu 30 Grad. Es wird auch morgen sehr schwül sein, obwohl die Temperaturen noch noch mal ein Stückchen heruntergehen. Der Wind bringt keine wirkliche Erfrischung, er weht schwach aus unterschiedlichen Richtungen. Schauen wir auf die weiteren Tage. Ich sagte es schon, in der Nacht zum Mittwoch gibt es diesen Luftmassenwechsel, der Mittwoch selbst. Schön. Vielleicht noch ein ganz einzelner Regenschauer, meistens trocken, Temperaturen angenehm, 22 bis 24 Grad. Und dann kommt der Donnerstag ebenfalls mit Sonnenschein und angenehmen 21 bis 24 Grad. Die große Hitze ist damit vorbei und so geht es dann auch in der nächsten Woche weiter. Der morgige Tag noch einmal zusammengefasst, einzelne kräftige Gewitter und ich sage nur zum Abend und in der Nacht gibt es davon mehr. Zurück zu euch. Die Gewitter, die haben nämlich jetzt die Hitze in vielen Regionen Deutschlands abgelöst und das blieb auch nicht immer ohne Folgen. Nordöstlich von Berlin zum Beispiel stürzten Bäume um, eine Bahnstrecke nach Polen musste gesperrt werden. 
Und auch weiter südlich ein ganz ähnliches Bild. Aus Bayern melden die Feuerwehren ebenso umgestürzte Bäume und vollgelaufene Keller. In diesem Haus im Allgäu zum Beispiel stand das Wasser zwei Meter hoch. Und überall gilt auch weiterhin, nach der Rekordhitze bleiben die Gewitter erst einmal erhalten. Schauen wir ins All. Zwei russische Kosmonauten haben am Abend sechseinhalb Stunden lang außen an der Raumstation ISS gearbeitet. Dabei brachten Genadi Padalka und Yuri Malenchenko rund 350 Kilometer über der Erde unter anderem Schutzschilde gegen Meteoriten an. Der Außeneinsatz hatte sich um eine Stunde verzögert, weil so lange nicht ganz klar war, ob eine Luke zwischen zwei ISS-Modulen auch wirklich dicht war. Yes, let's move on. That's good. All right, now you can lower it down a little bit. Okay, I think we have enough length for the tether, so now we can move to the right. Okay, we're moving to the right. It's light now. Beautiful. Yeah, and it's beautiful on this end as well. Can you see it? Keep going, Yuri, keep going. In the upper right-hand portion of this view, we can also see the uh, Strello 1 cargo boom being extended down from uh, the uh, Poisk module. Yuri Malenchenko is at the other end of that boom. This is a helmet camera on Gennady Padalka's helmet. Keep going. That's it. Spacewalkers are 45 minutes into today's spacewalk. And the ball handle is uh, closed as well. The retractable tether is on the Strela. I have released the base and I'm going to be getting ready for the transition. Where he'll join Gennady Padalka and the two will uh, prepare Strela 2 to be transported. When that's done, Malenchenko will translate back down to the Strela 1 operator post at Poisk and will hand crank that boom to maneuver Padalka and the Strela 2 from their current location to the forward and star starboard side of the Zarya module. Uh, he arrived already. Yeah, we can continue. That's fine. Another view now from a camera on the space station's Canada arm that is looking back across the uh, truss and uh, back toward the uh, Russian section of the space station. Just uh, above and to the left of the center of the frame is the Poisk module. And you look closely there, you can see uh, Yuri Malenchenko working at the operator post of the Strela 1. The arm is extending out to the, uh, to the right at about a 50-degree uh, angle from the top. It is forward of those uh, partially collapsed solar arrays. You can see them now in the uh, upper right-hand portion of the view. kind of jammed here. Okay, here we go. Before, uh, uh, okay, great. Again, Malenchenko at the operator's post. He's wearing the uh, suit with the blue stripe. Padalka is uh, on on board the Strela 1 for the ride. He is wearing the suit with the red stripe. Something stop? Exactly, that's where it is. Stop. All right. Uh, just y you can From Padalka's helmet camera, now you can see that the, they made some progress since we last saw this view uh, moving forward. They collapsed the Zarya solar array wings in the lower portion of the frame. And some more. And Padalka pulls the uh, Sphera satellite back to him. The uh, satellite is to be jettisoned uh, down toward the Earth and aft of the station, so that it's not a uh, it's not an an issue for the satellite to uh, come back and intersect the uh, space station's orbit. The rod is not on the way either.
Так, ну что, я перехожу и пошел. Окей, now. The two spacewalkers will be working together to attach all five of these uh, panels. Their uh, first work site will be uh, uh, near where uh, Padalka is currently located on the uh, lower portion of the starboard side of the small diameter of the Zvezda module. Aboard the International Space Station, Expedition 32 Commander Gennady Padalka and Flight Engineer Yuri Malenchenko of the Russian Federal Space Agency ventured outside the Piers airlock on a spacewalk to install debris shields on the Zvezda service module. The two also moved a telescoping cargo crane from Piers to the Zarya module. The excursion is one of two station EVAs slated for August. On August 30th, NASA flight engineer Sonny Williams and flight engineer Aki Hoshide of the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency are scheduled to egress the Quest airlock for a six and a half hour spacewalk to perform electrical work on the truss and install cables for a future Russian laboratory module. It will be Hoshide's first spacewalk and the third for a Japanese astronaut. Good morning from NASA's Johnson Space Center. This is Mission Control Houston. You're inside the International Space Station Flight Control Room. As you look at a team of flight controllers that are watching over the systems aboard the International Space Station, the uh, Expedition 32 crew is uh, busy aboard the station. They uh, have an abbreviated work day, but uh, nonetheless busy uh, having uh, recycled a bit after Monday's uh, Russian EVA or extravehicular activity that saw all of the tasks uh, completed that were planned during that spacewalk that lasted just under uh, six hours. The uh, spacewalk was the 163rd um, EVA um, in support of station assembly and maintenance and experiment work outside the complex. It was the ninth for uh, Gennady Padalka and the uh, fifth for Yuri Malenchenko. The uh, next spacewalk uh, planning is already underway uh, for that spacewalk that Sonny Williams and Aki Hoshide will perform on uh, August 30th, late next week. They uh, will be uh, operating that uh, spacewalk, conducting that spacewalk out of the Russia or U.S. segment of the uh, station, the Quest airlock. Earlier uh, Tuesday, uh, Joe Akaba worked with Aki Hoshide uh, in the Japanese uh, experiment module, working on the external airlock portion of the uh, module, a, a unique addition to the Japanese experiment laboratory. And uh, in and around that, uh, Sonny Williams worked with the burning and suppression of solids uh, experiments, uh, wrapping up an experiment operation uh, um, with all of the igniters. Uh, that experiment's been operated for on and off for a couple of months. Uh, the next uh, opportunity will be when some new igniters are delivered to the station in about three months. The uh, three U.S. operating system uh, crew members, that would be Joe Acaba, Sonny Williams, and uh, Aki Hoshide, uh, are also uh, preparing today for a procedural review for the uh, spacewalk mentioned uh, that uh, Williams and Hoshide will perform on the 30th. So they'll be uh, conducting a procedural review as part of their workday Tuesday as well. So another busy day uh, for the Expedition 32 crew aboard the International Space Station and uh, they will reset their clocks and get back to their normal schedule um, after uh, today's uh, heading to bed about 4.30 in the afternoon. Polarlichter gehören zu den geheimnisvollen Schauspielen der Natur. Für uns Mitteleuropäer sind sie ein seltenes Erlebnis. Verantwortlich dafür ist die unruhige Sonne. Sogenannte Protuberanzen wie diese sind auf der Sonne Normalität. Aus ihnen können sich jedoch gewaltige Gasausbrüche entwickeln, sogenannte Sonneneruptionen. Dabei werden Billionen Tonnen von heißen elektrisch geladenen Gasen ins All geschleudert. Auf dem Weg durch das Sonnensystem kann ein solcher Sonnensturm auch die Erde treffen und Chaos im Erdmagnetfeld auslösen. Eine Folge davon ist das schillernde Leuchten der äußeren Atmosphäre, die Polarlichter. Gefürchtet sind dagegen sogenannte elektromagnetische Pulse. 
Das gestörte Magnetfeld erzeugt heftige Ströme, zum Beispiel in Freileitungen, die wie riesige Antennen wirken. Durch die Stromspitzen können ganze Transformatoranlagen verschmoren. Es kommt zu weiträumigen Stromausfällen. Solche Ereignisse vorherzusehen, ist eine Herausforderung der Sonnenforscher. Tatsächlich wissen die Astronomen seit Jahrhunderten, dass die Sonne im Rhythmus von elf Jahren bestimmte Veränderungen durchläuft. Besonders augenfällig in diesem Schwabe-Zyklus ist die Anzahl der Sonnenflecken. Alle elf Jahre gibt es besonders viele Flecken. Die Flecken entstehen, wenn Magnetfelder aus dem Inneren der Sonne durch die Oberfläche ragen. An diesen Stellen wird der Wärmetransport aus dem Sonneninneren gestört. Es entstehen kühlere Regionen, die etwas dunkler erscheinen. Der Elfjahreszyklus rührt von der besonderen Eigendrehung der Sonne. Am Äquator rotiert sie etwas schneller als in der Nähe der Pole. Die Magnetfelder in der Sonne werden dadurch mehr und mehr verdrillt. So lange, bis sich das Magnetfeld der Sonne umpolt. Seit 1749 zeichnen Forscher die Aktivität der Sonne auf, indem sie die Zahl der Sonnenflecken beobachten. Heute ist es möglich, die Geschichte der Sonnenflecken noch weiter zurückzuverfolgen. Mittlerweile weiß man, dass die Sonne nicht nur den Elfjahreszyklus besitzt. So vermutet man einen etwa 100-jährigen Zyklus, einen 220-jährigen und noch mindestens drei weitere, die bis zu 2000 Jahre andauern. Wie diese langfristigen Zyklen entstehen, ist unklar. Sicher ist nur, dass die komplexe Dynamik des Sonnenmagnetfeldes eine entscheidende Rolle dabei spielen muss. Weil sich die Zyklen ständig überlagern, kommt es zu einem scheinbar chaotischen Auf und Ab der Sonnenaktivität. Besonders ruhig war die Sonne in der Zeit von 1650 bis 1700. Just in der Zeit, als in Mitteleuropa die sogenannte kleine Eiszeit herrschte. Viele Forscher sehen hier einen Zusammenhang. Die geringere Sonneneinstrahlung könnte in der Vergangenheit durchaus die Temperaturen auf der Erde beeinflusst haben. Für kurzfristige Prognosen über heftige Sonnenstürme sind die Zyklen aber kaum geeignet, denn die Zyklen scheinen zu variieren. So hat der aktuelle Elfjahreszyklus ganze zwei Jahre später begonnen, als von den Forschern erwartet. Im Moment steuern wir aber mit rasantem Tempo dem nächsten Maximum entgegen. They were the first discovery of the space age. Yet half a century later, the Van Allen belts are still a mystery. But that is about to change. Join us as we make history operating two spacecraft in this fierce environment of the Earth's radiation belts. Flying through these two donut-shaped regions of high-energy particles, the twin spacecraft will gather data to help us learn more about the sun's influence in this extreme environment and understand how the variations affect work in space and life on the ground. With these spacecraft, we will provide the key to understanding the extremes of space weather. Buckle up for the ride that begins in 2012. In order to study powerful and devastating hurricanes, NASA uses special research aircraft designed to survive a voyage into the heart of the storm. In 2012, scientists will finally be able to study another kind of storm in a hazardous area high above Earth when two very tough spacecraft, the Radiation Belt Storm Probes, are launched. The Radiation Belt Storm Probes, known as RBSP, will help scientists understand how geomagnetic storms caused by our sun affect the Van Allen radiation belts. Highly charged particles in the belts can harm satellites and astronauts. Scientists want to study the radiation belts because there's a lot that we don't know about how particles um, and events travel from the sun through the Earth's environment and affect the radiation belts. Learning more about the belts will allow engineers to build tougher satellites better equipped to deal with the harsh conditions there. We also have astronauts that are out in space, and the more we understand about the radiation, the better we can protect those astronauts. This is a field where we go out there and we're doing things on the cutting edge. We don't necessarily, uh, we don't understand everything. And 
now we understand more but if we're ever going to work in space if we're ever going to harness the things that are out there we have to understand the environment and RBSP is going to go a very long way towards doing that because the radiation belts are one of the most hazardous area that we have in space. The RBSP team needed to build two extremely rugged spacecraft in order to perform science studies in the radiation belts. Building a spacecraft to operate in the harsh radiation belt environment was one of the most challenging things for me working on RBSP. We added a lot of shielding to some of the electronics. We also did a large test program where we tested all of the parts and materials that we're using on the spacecraft to make sure that they'll be able to survive those doses of radiation. Radiation is, is bad for electronics. It causes processors to reset. And um, so if you just flew your computer through the radiation belt, it really wouldn't work. We need to have all the electronics up and operating through those main events. And so we've taken um, just adding thicker metal walls around all the electronics boxes that stop a lot of that radiation and prevent them from getting to the sensitive electronics inside. We have a transceiver that has highly sensitive parts on board that spacecraft that's going to have to survive this harsh radiation environment. One of the things that we've done to mitigate that is actually build our radio almost like a tank. There's lots of charged particles and it's very likely that the electronics on this spacecraft are going to freeze up at some point or lock up, much like our home computers do. And when they lock up, you like to reboot them. Most spacecraft that we build are designed to be powered on and stay on forever and never turn off. But because of the likelihood of a lockup on this mission, because of where we're flying the satellites, we've designed in an ability to send in commands from the ground to remotely reboot several of the important boxes on the spacecraft. The other design challenge facing the RBSB team was the requirement to build two of these radiation-hardened craft. Because the radiation belts swell and shrink over time, two spacecraft are required to understand how the belts are behaving both in size and shape. Each RBSP spacecraft carries an identical set of five instrument suites designed to study how the radiation belts change during geomagnetic storms. These instruments will provide scientists with previously unavailable data about the fundamental processes behind particle acceleration and reveal the mechanisms behind the radiation belt's behavior. RBSP's data will also lead to more accurate space weather prediction models and help improve future spacecraft design. As with every spacecraft NASA launches, RBSP undergoes a series of rigorous tests to ensure it's ready for its mission. We'll actually put the spacecraft in a room and uh, turn up the speakers and blow loud sounds at the spacecraft to simulate what happens during launch. The team also simulates RBSP's operations while the spacecraft are in the cold and hot airless vacuum of space. We try to simulate the environments that the spacecraft will be in and that allows us to go into launch with, with high confidence that the spacecraft will actually work when they're up there in, in their flight environments. To see the spacecraft working for the very first time after it gets up there in space is really gratifying because you've worked so hard for so many years planning it out and to see it finally work, it's pretty cool. That's probably the best part. The most rewarding part of my job as project manager is seeing the team come together and see their handiwork come to fruition. And ultimately, the biggest reward is when we launch and see the two spacecraft come to life on orbit. Good afternoon, everyone. This is the pre-launch news conference for the Radiation Belt Storm Probes to be launched for NASA and the Applied Physics Laboratory later this week on a United Launch Alliance Atlas V rocket. Here to talk about the upcoming launch is Mike Luther, the Deputy Associate Administrator for the Science Mission Directorate, Directorate at NASA headquarters in Washington. Tim Dunn, the NASA Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center. Fern Thorpe, the Program Manager for NASA Missions for the United Launch Alliance. Rick Fitzgerald, the RBSP Project Manager from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. And Kathy Winters, the Launch Weather Officer from the 45th Weather Squadron at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. 
And we'll begin first with our opening remarks from Mike Luther. Mike. Thanks, George. Um, good afternoon. Um, on behalf of NASA's uh, Science Mission Directorate, I'm uh, pleased to uh, welcome everybody to uh, the pre-launch and launch activities associated with the RBSP, um, our Radiation Storm Belt Probes, uh, Radiation Storm Belt Probes mission. Um, the uh, uh, We're all excited to be here today and uh, looking forward to a successful uh, mission. RBSP is a um, element of uh, the Science Mission Directorate's program under the Heliophysics Division. Uh, it is uh, under that division an element of the Living with the Star program, which is specifically designed to better understand the relationship between uh, the Earth and its environment and, and the Sun. The twin spacecraft um, for uh, RBSP will add a significant element and capability to the overall cadre of missions that the Science Mission Directorate flies uh, across four scientific disciplines. RBSP in itself will focus uh, its investigation uh, on under better understanding and ultimately predicting the uh, response and changes associated with the Earth's radiation belt, or Van Allen belts, as they're known. Uh, the, the, the twin spacecraft will fly in highly elliptical but slightly different orbits, thus enabling for the first time uh, the kind of spatial and temporal sampling that will allow us to, in fact, do better uh, scientific investigations and improve our modeling capability of the belts and their response to solar input. That t spatial and temporal data can be combined with the data from another spacecraft, uh, also an element of living with a star called the, the Solar Dynamics Observatory, which was launched in early 2010, so that we can at one time see the solar uh, impulse into the, the, uh, the Earth's environment and the radiation belts, and then watch over time and space how those belts uh, morph or change and respond. At the same time, uh, the, uh, the spacecraft will uh, also contribute operationally as their data will be pr pr uh, delivered in near real time to users all over the world so that uh, those users can, um, can use the space weather data to protect, protect sensitive ground-based as well as space-based uh, assets that may reside out there. All in all, RBSP represents a giant step forward for uh, the Science Mission Directorate and certainly for the heliophysics community, and we look forward to a successful launch. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. And now to Tim Dunn, the NASA Launch Director from the Kennedy Space Center. Tim. Thank you, George. I'm proud to be here today representing the men and women of the Launch Services Program here at Kennedy Space Center. The Radiation Belt Storm Probes, or RBSP mission, will be my third as NASA Launch Manager, and I'm thrilled to continue my Launch Director duties with the twin spacecraft launched on an Atlas V that will serve as the baseline for all radiation belt science for the next generation. This truly is a mission that would have thrilled my high school physics teacher, Mr. Skelton. Yesterday, we decided to delay the RBSP launch one day from Thursday to Friday. A test anomaly occurred Saturday night on another first stage Atlas engine, the RD-180, at the United Launch Alliance rocket factory in Decatur, Alabama. The RD-180 under test at Decatur experienced an anomaly in the actuator system that moves the engine for steering and flight. The combined NASA and ULA technical team jointly agreed yesterday that additional testing and assessment is required to verify the same anomalous condition is not present on RBSP's launch vehicle engine hardware. Due to this one-day delay, the Launch Readiness Review, or LRR, was moved from this morning to tomorrow afternoon. This allows our engineering and analytical teams adequate time to clear the RBSP vehicle for launch. NASA has a great record flying on the Atlas V. 
we've successfully launched six missions on this rocket. Missions to Pluto, Jupiter, the Moon, the Sun, and two spacecraft to Mars, most recently the Mars Curiosity rover. RBSP will be our seventh NASA mission on an Atlas V, the 28th Atlas V to be launched from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and the 32nd Atlas V overall. RBSP will launch on an Atlas V-401 vehicle from Space Launch Complex 41, also known as Slick 41. The 401 configuration has a 4-meter diameter payload fairing and no solid rocket boosters. Slick 41 is proud to have hosted 27 Atlas V launches to date. Now I'd like to show you a video of the ULA crew building up the Atlas V launch vehicle at the pad. Please roll the tape. Here we see the RBSB first stage after it was offloaded at Port Canaveral on its way to the Sp Atlas Space Flight Operations Center, or ASOC. Made in Decatur, Alabama, the first stage is transported to Cape Canaveral via the ship, the Mariner. This offload and transport happened in the middle of June, on June 16th. Here we see the second stage of the Atlas V, the Centaur. This offload occurred at the end of May this year, on May 24th. It's being transported to the same facility, the ASOC, on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, where it will be electrically connected to the first stage for horizontal checkout. That checkout occurred during the last two weeks in June and the first week in July. After that checkout, you see the first stage booster being transported from the ASOC out to the VIF which is the vertical integration facility shown here. The VIF is located near Complex 41 and is where we build up and process all of the Atlas V vehicles. You'll see uh, here the erection sequence using the VIF crane. The overhead crane lifts the first stage booster and tr brings it into the VIF and sets it down on the MLP or mobile launch platform. This is a nice view uh, from the, uh, the tail side looking up, uh, seeing the power plant RD-180 engine there. Uh, three days later, in the middle of July, we transported the Centaur second stage out to the VIF for its sequence of erection and mate to the top of the first stage of the Atlas V. Uh, the power plant for the second stage is the Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne RL-10. So you'll see the erection sequence here using the same VIF overhead crane under the watchful eye of ULA employees. We erect the second stage Centaur and uh, bring it in and set it down on top of the first stage. A nice uh, view there of the RL-10 on the aft side of second stage. The next shot you'll see is of the completed first and second stage in the VIF just days before spacecraft arrival. In the early morning hours of August 10th, we transported the spacecraft out to the VIF. Here you see the uh, twin RBSP spacecraft encapsulated by the four meter fairing. Uh, after rollout uh, from the spacecraft processing facility, we erected uh, the encapsulated assembly and mated it to the top of Centaur. And there you see the completed Atlas V vehicle as it sits today. The RBSP launch campaign has gone very well. Over the past 10 days since RBSP mate, the Atlas V team has been busy with launch preparations. Last Tuesday, we performed the final integrated systems test with the spacecraft and rocket. Last Thursday, the combined NASA and ULA launch team held the flight readiness review where we assess the preparations of the launch vehicle, range and facility assets, and the readiness of the twin RBSP spacecraft. Then, on Friday, we performed a successful mission dress rehearsal to exercise and prepare the entire ULA, NASA, and Air Force Atlas V launch team. Tomorrow, we will conduct the launch readiness review for the mission where senior NASA, ULA, and Air Force management will assess readiness of the rocket, spacecraft, and range to proceed with launch on Friday morning. On Wednesday, we will begin final launch preparations at approximately 10 a.m. Eastern Time by rolling the Atlas V on its mobile launch platform 
approximately one quarter mile from the VIF to Slick 41, and then loading the highly refined kerosene RP1 fuel in the first stage fuel tank. Thursday will serve as a crew synchronization day to prepare the launch team for arrival on console just after 10.30 p.m. Thursday night. The crew will perform final preparations of vehicle power on and electrical checks, followed by cryogenic tanking of the first stage liquid oxygen and second stage centaur liquid oxygen and liquid hydrogen, beginning at 1.40 a.m. Friday morning. Final engine slews will then be performed after tanking and we will be ready for launch early Friday morning at 4.07 a.m. Eastern Time with a 20-minute window. In summary, after LRR tomorrow, the Atlas V rocket will be ready and the launch team is prepared and excited to launch these radiation belt storm probes. Back to you, George. Thank you, Tim. And now to Fern Thorpe, the program manager for NASA missions from United Launch Alliance to talk about the ULA role and the flight of the Atlas V. Fern? Hey, thank you, George. Good afternoon. On behalf of Michael Gass, our president and chief, chief executive officer, and the 3,600 men and women of United Launch Alliance, I'm honored to be part of the team that will launch our BSP. Uh, this will be ULA's seventh launch of the year. Uh, Tim mentioned it's also the 32nd Atlas V launch, and it'll be the 63rd launch for ULA overall. Uh, since the inaugural EELV flights in 2002, Atlas V and Delta IV vehicles have launched more than 50 times, delivering vital national security missions for the U.S. Air Force and the National Reconnaissance Office, science and exploration payloads for NASA, and imaging and communication satellites for commercial companies. We've worked together with our NASA, NASA Launch Services Program customer on numerous missions, uh, including the uh, recent Mars Science Lab, uh, which was launched, launched on an Atlas V uh, here from the Cape just last November, and uh, of course had a spectacular landing uh, recently on the surface of Mars. Uh, as for all of our missions, the team has worked tremendously hard to get us to this point, and we are almost ready to launch our BSP on its mission to help us better understand the effect of solar activity on our near-Earth environment. Uh, this, mention, this mission will be launched on an Atlas V 401 with the 4-meter fairing and no SRBs. And uh, the booster stage will be powered by the RD-180 engine uh, provided by RD Amros. And we'll have a Pratt & Whitney Rocketdyne RL-10A-4 engine on the Centaur upper stage. And now I'd like to show some animation of the launch sequence to give you a preview of what to expect on Friday morning. Okay, the vehicle stands about 190 feet tall uh, on the pad, and when we light the RD-180 engine, it'll be putting out about 860,000 pounds of thrust uh, at liftoff at sea level. The first major event that you'll see during this flight, since we don't have any SRBs to jettison, will be the depletion of fuels in the main booster tank, uh, the shutdown of the, the main engine, and the separation of that Atlas booster stage. That will occur roughly four minutes into flight. After we separate that booster stage, uh, we'll prepare the Centaur engines for ignition and we'll light them for the uh, first of two engine burns. There you see the uh, retro rockets firing to separate the booster stage. That's the chill down sequence for the RL-10 engines and then we'll light the engines. About eight seconds into that first engine burn, we will also jettison the payload fairing. The total duration for this first engine burn will be about 9 minutes and 15 seconds. And that will place us into a parking orbit coast, which is a pretty typical mission profile for an Atlas vehicle. That coast is almost an hour, it's about 55 minutes. At the end of that coast, we'll be in position for the second engine burn, so we'll light the uh, Centaur engine again. That'll be a shorter burn, about 4 minutes and 40 seconds. And after that, we will orient the vehicle, uh, do a spin-up and separate the first of the two spacecraft. We will then uh, reorient again, uh, use the settling thrusters to change the orbit just slightly for that second spacecraft, and we'll separate it about 12 minutes later. And then following separation of the second spacecraft, we'll uh, do the usual contamination and collision avoidance maneuver to uh, prevent any, any possibility of recontact of the Centaur upper stage with the spacecraft. 
Uh, we are proud to serve a critical role in delivering one-of-a-kind NASA payloads to orbit in support of the global science community. ULA is focused on perfect product delivery for RBSP and for every mission we launch for NASA and for all of our other customers. Perfect product delivery includes a relentless focus on mission success, a focus on one launch at a time, and continuous improvement in meeting all of the needs of our customers. This mission is the culmination of years of hard work by NASA's Launch Services Program, NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center, the Johns Hopkins University Applied Physics Lab, and the ULA launch team. Once again, I want to thank all of our mission partners who have worked with us tirelessly to make this launch a success. Back to you, George. Thank you, Vern. And now to Rick Fitzgerald, the RBSP project manager from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Rick? Thank you, George. Well, I'm pleased and honored to be here today to represent the RBSP project, uh, which is uh, considered to be uh, part of the program that, that Mike described, uh, the Living with a Star program. Um, our team members uh, are, include the Applied Physics Laboratory, uh, which is my home institution, but all of our instrument providers, uh, so we have principal investigators from the University of Iowa, the University of New Hampshire, the New Jersey Institute of Technology, and the University of Minnesota. And we are um, also partnered with the Goddard Space Flight Center, um, which is where the LWS program office resides, and um, also a contributed instrument from the National Reconnaissance Office. So without all these instrument partners and uh, teaming arrangements, uh, today uh, wouldn't be possible. So um, I'm really happy to be here to represent that entire group. Um, what I'd like to do is talk a little bit about uh, picking up with the, um, the sequence uh, after launch that, that Vern just described, and then come back and talk a little bit more about the science of the mission. And I have some video about our processing that we've undergone uh, while we're down here after shipping uh, from APL. Um, so the first thing is uh, the launch sequence. So uh, you saw that uh, we have two spacecraft. Uh, we get dropped off after a spin-up of the Centaur stage. Uh, the A spacecraft uh, will separate at approximately 80 minutes after launch over Hawaii, and the second spacecraft, B, will separate just a few minutes after that. Um, and as uh, Mike pointed out, um, we will be in slightly different orbits, and that's by design, uh, so that we can achieve the science that we've all been waiting for for decades. Um, after we separate, the spacecraft uh, uh, maintain a spin rate. Um, the first uh, actuation that really occurs is we uh, open up our, our solar panels and go power positive by getting sunlight on our solar panels and start charging our batteries again. Um, following that, we uh, deploy uh, some booms on the end of two of those panels, which are the, um, uh, the emphasis instrument, uh, their magnetometer, which is also uh, critical to uh, not only the science but also our spacecraft operations. So those things happen early on in the sequence. Uh, we launch with um, our sub spacecraft subsystems partially on and uh, the first thing we do is we check out the RF subsystem uh, and make sure that we're seeing all the link margins that we expect to see as we pass over uh, the various ground stations. Uh, we also have our spacecraft processor partially on and uh, of course our power subsystems. Um, we will then check out our, our guidance navigation and control and then uh, there's a carefully sequenced 60-day uh, commissioning period where uh, in this choreographed um, activity we carefully turn on each instrument one by one and uh, all this has been uh, very carefully coordinated with all the, uh, the PIs on the mission. Um, at the end of 60 days, all the uh, deployments uh, will have happened, all the instruments will be turned on, and uh, we will be ready to start the science of the mission. Um, one thing to point out is uh, 2012 is an important year for us because we're, we're launching in a, uh, a period of high solar activity, so we're, we're nearing solar max, which means we stand the best chance of seeing a lot of solar activity excite the radiation belts, and that's exactly what we want to see happen. Uh, so a little bit about the science, and uh, you will get a, a full science briefing later on. Um, but you will hear that, um, that we've been waiting for this mission for decades. Uh, the Van Allen belts were discovered in 1958, and since that time, um, we know something about the radiation belts, but um, not enough. This mission is, is designed to really understand the whole solar 
interaction with radiation belts and understand why they are excited and sometimes why they're not. And uh, the mission design itself is, um, is part of that equation. So we, uh, we're at 10 degrees inclination in a highly elliptical orbit so that we uh, cruise in and out of both radiation belts throughout the mission. Uh, the satellites lap each other, and you'll hear more about that, about why that's important for the measurement that we're making. And uh, the two-year mission life uh, allows us a full cycle of, um, of these lapping rates and, and allowing us to precess around back to the place where we injected into orbit so that we see kind of a full season of, um, of activity in a sense. Um, what I'd like to do next is talk about the processing that we've, we've undertaken since we've come down um, here to the Cape. And if you'll uh, start the video, I'll walk you through that. This is the C-17 uh, Air Force plane that um, brought us safely down to the Cape. So we trucked uh, from uh, the Applied Physics Laboratory over in Laurel, Maryland, over to Andrews Air Force Base, loaded onto the C-17 in the wee hours of the morning, and arrived here at the Cape. You can see there the two satellite canisters uh, under purge to keep them protected from the environment. We arrived at Astrotech just outside the KSC gates here. This happened on May 1st. You can see our, our technicians carefully unwrapping uh, both spacecraft and, um, and days later uh, opening up the spacecraft. So we need to make sure after we arrived that the, we didn't have any disruption to the spacecraft due to the ride. Here's some black light cleaning. Uh, the black light allows us to see all dust particles all over the spacecraft and, and clean those appropriately. This is one of our tests we perform, the magnetic swing test, where we actually swing the spacecraft through a magnetic field to make sure that it's magnetically silent. We also went through a spin test. I mentioned that we spin on orbit at about 5 RPM, so we have to make sure we're still well balanced. Uh, here's some more cleaning in the black light. Uh, here we are with some of the panels raised and getting ready for a deployment test with the, uh, the solar panels, and you can see the emphasis instruments there. And there's a G-negated test of the solar array deployment uh, with the booms for the, the emphasis instrument. Um, the high bay that we're in is tremendous. It's a great uh, facility there at AstroTech. You can see all of our techs in uh, clean room garb, plenty of space to work on two spacecraft. Here's the emphasis uh, deployment, G-negated. Uh, so it gives you an idea of what that looks like when we uh, deploy that boom shortly after we get on orbit. And uh, here, here we are with um, some of our final closeout activities and our uh, mission assurance folks uh, taking a careful look at the spacecraft as we move from step to step. All the, uh, the scripts that they have on their, um, on their laptops and, um, and also all of the, the motion tests that uh, have to be measured and, and compared against what we expected. This is a spacecraft stack being moved on the dolly uh, to get ready for encapsulation into the fairing. And there you can see the second half of the fairing uh, closing us up for the last time uh, right there. That was a big day for us that happened last week. Uh, the team is uh, assessing to make sure that we're all in good condition and we're backing up, getting ready to be transported from AstroTech over to the VIF. Uh, there's uh, our team carefully loading onto the truck and again in the middle of the night uh, moving uh, over toward the VIF so that we don't have any vehicular traffic to worry about and the caravan that's carefully motoring us at uh, a safe seven miles per hour over to the VIF. So uh, again, I'd, I'd like to say um, how excited we are about this mission. This uh, culminates more than five years of effort. And in fact, um, the, the first planning stages from, from the science uh, happened in 2001. There was a, a meeting to, uh, to talk about what the science would be and uh, what we wanted to, to measure and how we wanted to do that. So many, many years of activity uh, preparing for this, this day. And, um, and in fact, um, since the 50s, to try to unlock some of the mysteries of the Van Allen belts. So uh, again, uh, on behalf of the team, uh, thanks for everyone's support to get us to here. And uh, we're looking forward to launch day on Friday, when we're going to see all this work uh, finally come to fruition on orbit. George. Thank you, Rick. Now to Kathy Winters, our launch weather officer for the 45th Weather Squadron at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Kathy. Thank you, George. 
Well, we are looking for uh, afternoon thunderstorms like we've been seeing each day here in Florida. It's pretty typical for this time of year. We do have a strong upper level trough that's been digging down in the eastern U.S. and it's actually going to dig a deep a bit further in the next few days. And so we expect for all the thunderstorm activity that does occur in Florida to migrate towards the east coast here towards us. So we continue to expect to see afternoon storms in the area. And on, um, as we get into uh, launch day, uh, the day before launch is Thursday, we'll be seeing those storms and then we'll have some residual cloud love cover that will linger in the area in the overnight hours and that just causes us some concern that we could violate the thick cloud rule uh, for launch. The other area that we're watching, there's an area in the tropics that we're keeping an eye on as well. It's a couple hundred miles east of the Lesser Antilles. Let me go ahead and show you a satellite picture to kind of explain where that is. You can see uh, on the satellite picture uh, a few hundred miles east of the Lesser Antilles there is a wave that's developing. Uh, this is uh, right now has an 80% chance of tropical cyclone development within the next 40 hours according to the Hurricane Center. So it does pose a risk for um, the Lesser Antilles and Antigua, but it should move through that area on Wednesday, uh, be off to the west and still have another day to recover there. And, and uh, they may stow the antennas if they need to, but then they can redeploy them and be ready for launch. Um, for the eastern U.S., uh, there is that trough there, so we'll be watching for that residual cloud cover. You can see it on the satellite picture, and there's a boundary associated with that as well in northern Georgia. That is going to sag down on Thursday into the area. And so with that, we have a little bit more concern for cloud cover for Friday morning than we typically do this time of year uh, just because that additional boundary that's going to be lingering in the area. So right now um, our main concern for launch is a violation of the thick cloud rule. We have a 40 percent chance of that launch commit criteria violation and the thick cloud rule um, we have that rule to prevent uh, triggered lightning. Uh, it's not natural lightning created by a thunderstorm but lightning that can be triggered uh, due to a rocket launching through elevated electrical fields. Now, if we happen to delay 24 hours, uh, the big question mark will be what, what is that tropical wave going to do? Right now, uh, some of the models bring it, most of the models bring it actually straight west, but then some of the models actually bring it a little bit more towards the north and headed into uh, Hispaniola and then just southeast of southeastern Cuba uh, by, uh, as we get into Saturday morning. What that means for us is that uh, the ridge actually migrates back up to the north and we get into more of an easterly flow pattern and that can cause some isolated showers to occur on Saturday morning. So our main concern if we happen to delay 24 hours would be a cumulus cloud rule violation that's associated with these uh, isolated showers and we'd be mainly watching for any cumulus clouds within 10 nautical miles of the launch pad and looking at how tall those clouds are to see if they violate the rule and, and we don't expect any lightning with those but again it's a more of a triggered lightning concern and that's what a lot of our lightning launch make criteria rules are about is triggered lightning. So overall um, still a better chance than not uh, when it comes to weather, still a 60 percent chance of having go weather uh, for launch but there is some concern for thick clouds on the morning of launch. All right, thank you Kathy. And we're ready now to take questions. Please give your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. And we'll start here in the front with Marcia. Um, Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, probably for Mr. Fitzgerald. Um, why has it taken so long to launch a spacecraft to the radiation belts to get a good handle on what's going over the, going on there? And um, if you could give a little history of perhaps other craft that have done research in this area, and how are you going to be protecting these two craft from a pretty hazardous environment? Thank you. Uh, some of the details about the, uh, the history, I think uh, some of our science folks could, could give you better. Uh, but I will say that there was a mission called CRESS um, that did uh, go to the radiation belts. Uh, it was a single spacecraft. And, um, and it unlocked some of the mysteries of the radiation belts, but left additional questions. For instance, this, this issue about seeing a lot of solar activity that you would expect may excite the radiation belts, but in fact did not. Why did that happen? Uh, we don't understand that. Uh, so um, the, uh, the Radiation Belt Storm Probes mission, uh, this twin satellite mission, is supremely equipped uh, to make the measurements that would help us understand <clears throat> what, those, um, what the processes are that are going on within the belts and, um, and due to coronal mass ejection. Um, with respect to how do we protect the, the mission, um, so that's a great question too. Um, so uh, I, I started off with an analogy. Uh, I'm a runner. And as a runner, there's uh, this slogan you see at track events that says, my sport is your sport's punishment. 
And on this mission, our mission is other missions punishment. Um, we're going to a place that other missions try to avoid, and we need to live there for two years. And that's uh, one of our biggest technical challenges. And so we did that on, on many uh, different uh, levels. Um, the first is uh, we have a lot of shielding of all electronic boxes. So um, we have uh, three, uh, 350 mils of aluminum shielding around our electronics. That's about a third of an inch uh, to give you a better feel for that. Um, and that helps protect against some of these uh, highly charged particles from penetrating our sensitive electronics. In addition, the electronics themselves, we uh, uh, selected a lot of radiation hardened parts. So uh, you can purchase those. Uh, they are more expensive than standard parts and they, they also give you some level of protection against um, both single event upset and cumulative radiation over time. Um, and, and so those things are the primary mechanism, mechanisms for us to protect against uh, the environment that we're going to fly in. Um, we also have uh, some other specialized things that we've done to help with the science measurements. So we need to be magnetically quiet, as you saw in that magnetic swing test. So basically that was kind of like walking through a magnetometer at the airport. Uh, if you had no metal in your pockets, the, uh, it doesn't go off. In that test, uh, we're also trying to make sure that the spacecraft itself is not inducing a magnetic field that would pick, be picked up by our emphasis instrument um, and, and therefore cause noise on that measurement. Uh, so there, there are a lot of uh, unique things about the mission that we had to think about and design into in order to make the, the sensitive measurements that we're going to make. Any other questions for our pre-launch panel here? Justin. Hi, Justin Wright with uh, SpaceFlightNow.com. Uh, two for, for Tim. Uh, um, are you phys physically doing anything on the RD-180 here, uh, on the vehicle here, or is it more of a paperwork analysis type of effort? And uh, would you expect this issue is going to be resolved by tomorrow's LRR? Yeah, let me uh, answer that, and I'll let uh, Vern add a little more. We're doing both, Justin. Uh, we are doing testing on the RBSP hardware today. Uh, we are doing uh, engine uh, cycling tests and as well as data review. We're doing a combination data review from the Decatur anomaly that occurred over the weekend uh, through the joint uh, team, the ULA team, NASA, as well as Pratt Whitney Rocketdyne. And uh, we, when the technical team uh, met yesterday afternoon, uh, I would categorize it as we did have uh, high confidence that we would be able to get through this, uh, but we did want to perform today's confidence testing as well as completed data review. Vern? Anything to add? No, I think Tim provided a good summary. Uh, we think we understand what the issue is. The testing that we're doing today will build up some separation between this engine and the engine in the factory where we saw the issue. Uh, e even though we think we know what the issue is, uh, we're going to move very slowly, very carefully today. The uh, testing itself that we're going to be uh, performing on the engine lasts about four hours, but some of our folks have about a 14-hour day ahead of them because of all the uh, all of the review and, and thought and preparation that goes into that to make sure uh, that, we, uh, that we're really on the right track. But I would say overall we're pretty optimistic uh, that we know what's happening. Quick uh, spacecraft question. Are you actually going into your final orbit when you come off of the Centaur, or do you have to do any sort of raising burns in your initial 60-day period? Essentially, we're injecting into the orbit that we want to be into. Of course, um, you know, we'll assess that after we get dropped off and, uh, and find out where exactly uh, we are. But um, we, the intent is that we'll, we'll begin our deployments, um, that we're in where we want to be. And as I said, over the next 60 days, uh, we will be turning on the science instruments and assessing what we have and, and where we are. But the direct answer to your question is yes, we're, we're essentially where we want to be when we get dropped off. James? Uh, James Dima Florite for Kathy and, and Tim, I think. Isn't space weather part of the, the launch forecast that you provide? Um, you know, what can you provide? Uh, why do you need it? And, and, you know, assuming the goal here is eventually to, to do that better, you know, how helpful would that be for you? It is. Uh, we do look at proton flux units, and right now it seems that this week so far is looking relatively quiet. There's a couple of sunspots that are rotating around the side of the sun that we're going to be watching for solar flare activity, but so far it's a, it's a little bit far out to tell if those are going to be active enough to generate a flare, and we'll get a better feel for that as we get a couple days before launch. But we will be watching proton, uh, for proton flux activity associated with solar flares. And you can give the why, I guess. <laughs> 
Yeah, we do monitor uh, the proton flux. It is a critical launch constraint for us. Uh, highly energized particles uh, would tend to cause uh, single event upsets or bit hits in uh, flight computers on launch vehicles. So uh, we do have a constraint for that and we do monitor that prior to launch. Just, just following up, can, can you speak um, just in general about the, the frequency of um, you know, space weather events affecting spacecraft, space-based assets, I guess. Um, obviously, again, that's a, a goal of better prediction is to protect those types of, of uh, assets. And, and, um, but it's not doesn't seem very often that I've, that, that I've heard of um, you know, a, a spacecraft being damaged or disabled from that sort of thing. So just, just trying to get a feel for how common this is. And, you know, yeah, I, I could speak from the, the launch vehicle side of it uh, because we do monitor for that type of uh, activity in the atmosphere, we're generally protected on the launch vehicle. So we don't tend to experience very much during the launch phase of operations. Uh, for the spacecraft side, uh, Rick, uh, you may have some uh, uh, knowledge of past uh, upsets of spacecraft on orbit and how that sure. affects them. Um, yeah, it's a bit of a conundrum. So we're worried about space weather when we're launching a mission to give us space weather, it's kind of like um, being worried about driving through snow to go skiing, right? So um, we are going to, uh, to uh, watch the forecast. Um, we're a little bit more resilient uh, than the, the launch vehicle is uh, for the space weather uh, because of the way we're built. Um, with respect to uh, space weather events, uh, sometimes you don't hear about them because uh, on-orbit assets try as best they can with the space weather predictions that we have. They can uh, turn off some sensitive electronics um, in order to uh, avoid single event upsets and actual failure. Um, and that's another part of our mission is to be able to um, give better space weather information that other agencies and, and other uh, spacecraft providers can use for their on-orbit assets. As, as far as uh, making the news, um, it makes the news when it affects the general population the most. Uh, so uh, when GPS is affected, um, that, that it, it can affect so many people in so many ways. It can affect airliners. It can affect uh, communication. It can affect a lot of things. And so when those kinds of things happen, you hear more about it. Or a communication satellite when, when a comm link is interrupted um, in, in the middle of an important event. Um, that kind of stuff makes the news. Um, a lot of things, a lot of science measurement um, spacecraft don't necessarily make the news if they have an event that they are dealing with. Um, so that's, that's something I can't really answer about when you hear about it and when you don't. That's more or less controlled by the media. But it is a real thing that you have to worry about, and this mission is all about helping everybody understand what's really out there that they need to deal with. Maybe I could um, contribute a little something there uh, just so you, you understand. We, uh, the Science Mission Directorate operates um, <clears throat> some 50-odd uh, missions. Uh, across our four uh, disciplines, um, I get a report uh, anytime one of those missions uh, uh, operations is disrupted. Um, anecdotally, I will tell you that uh, that's probably um, I, I, about once a month um, a mission will uh, so one not, not not the same mission every month, obviously, but of those that collective group of missions, uh, uh, probably 10, 12 times a year, uh, we'll have a, a satellite either have a disruption, um, uh, we refer to them as single event upsets, uh, or we do have some missions who, as Rick said, take uh, proactive action if we understand that there's a um, a solar event that's taking place in order to avoid a, a problem. Um, the, the impact of that may not make the press because it doesn't impact people day to day, but we're talking about space assets that cost hundreds of millions of dollars to collect science data. We don't like losing one bit, one, I, I mean that literally bit, of uh, science data. And so uh, it's, it's a very disturbing event when we have to uh, shut a, an instrument down or a spacecraft down, bring it back up again. Uh, we can recover from those, we, we, we always do, and, uh, or almost always do, uh, but um, the recovery means that you've lost some time period 
uh, of data. So it's not an insignificant impact to, um, uh, to the on-orbit assets. Marsha, follow-up? Yes, two quick follow-ups. Um, the $386 million cost of the mission, does that, that includes the launch costs? The no. total NASA mission cost is $686 million, and that does include the launch vehicle and all phases of the mission. And, and do you have any plans after launch to name A and B, or will uh, they always be A and B? There, there are some plans under discussion from NASA headquarters. I don't know, Mike, if you want to address that. Uh, well, uh, we, there, we have a process that we have to go through. There is, there's been a proposal. It has to be vetted uh, before we can make an announcement. Uh, so I am not prepared to, to make that announcement here, uh, but there are some, some proposals that are being considered for names that have to go, go through a process. Definitely after launch. Yeah, Definitely right, after. after the successful launch and so on. Mm -hmm. All right, uh, I think we have someone following on the uh, phone as well. Michael Wall, did you have a question? And uh, if you do, if you can give your affiliation. Oh, uh, yeah. Hi, this is Mike Wall from, from Space.com. Can you hear me? Yes. We can hear you. Okay, thanks. Sorry. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd just like a little more information about the anomaly. I mean, is this something that, that you guys have seen before? I mean, in the rocket? And, um, yeah, I mean, what are some of the steps that, that you're taking? I mean, I know you sort of outlined them, but, but, but could you go into a little bit more detail about sort of how you're like, going about fixing this? You want me to take that? Yeah, I'll let you take that. Okay, this is Vern Thorpe with United Launch Alliance. Uh, we can tell you that the uh, uh, anomaly that we saw was on a, a hydraulic system actuator, essentially. And uh, we've seen uh, similar, similar data signatures before on, uh, on similar actuators. And uh, that's the primary reason why we think we understand what's going on. Uh, that, that data signature combined with a, a detailed understanding of uh, the internal workings of uh, this hydraulic system. Um, I'm really not at liberty to go into too much more detail than that, uh, other than to say that uh, you know, even though we, th we think we understand it, we think we've got a good uh, hydraulic system on the engine uh, for the RBSP mission, uh, we're not going to take anything for granted or make any assumptions we don't have to. We're going to go in and do this screening test today that will give us confidence that the engine for RBSP is not susceptible to the same type of uh, anomalous data signature that we saw uh, back in the factory on an another engine. Thank you. All right, back uh, here for any last questions. All right, in that event, we're going to pause long enough just to change our players here on the dais, and we'll go into the RBSP mission science briefing. Thank you. Good afternoon once again. This is the mission science briefing for the radiation belt storm probes. And here to talk about the mission is Mona Kessel, the RBSP program scientist from NASA headquarters. Nikki Fox the RBSP Deputy Project Scientist from the Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Laboratory. Harlan Spence, Principal Investigator from the University of New Hampshire. Craig Klutzing, Principal Investigator from the University of Iowa. And Lou Lanzarotti, Principal Investigator from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. And we'll begin first with Mona Kessel, our program scientist. Mona? Thank you, George. So I want to start with answering a couple of simple questions. And if I could see my first graphic, please. I want to show a cutaway model of the radiation belts. Now, you've seen this before because this is our logo. It's been up on a lot of things. The two bright red areas are the radiation belts. You can see that they are encircling Earth, and if you can imagine them wrapping around, what they look like is a couple of donut-shaped uh, regions. And these regions are full of very high energy particles, and they're in these regions because they're trapped by Earth's magnetic field. They, they exist 
from about 650 miles above the surface and they go out, that's the inner belt, it goes out to about 8,000 miles and then the outer belt starts about 12,000, goes out to about 25,000. Now that's in a normal situation, but when we get solar storms, and we've heard about some solar storms, when we get those, then the radiation belts can expand, in fact, quite a bit. The inner belt can come down as close as 125 miles above the surface of the Earth. And that means that the International Space Station crosses through it and other low orbiting satellites. And the outer belt does the same thing. It expands outward and that means that geosynchronous satellites that are there, and there are about 300 of them out there, those are also then encompassed by the radiation belts. So these belts provide some hazard to the assets that are out there. But now having said that, I want to take you back in time, back to the 1950s, to the dawn of the space age, because the radiation belts were the very first discovery of the space age. And if I can get the next picture, please, then I'm showing a picture of four of the pioneering scientists of the time, starting left to right, Carl McElwain, James Van Allen, George Ludwig, and Ernie Ray. So these four men were instrumental in a lot of the early science. And in particular, Van Allen, second from the left, he was lecturing widely around the country. He was trying to get people interested in science, doing science in space in particular, because he, he wanted to study cosmic rays. And the few sounding rocket missions that had gone before, they went up, they'd be above the atmosphere for a few seconds, and then they'd come back down. So a satellite would provide so much more information. And so he teamed up with George Ludwig to build the instrument, a simple Geiger counter, and with Pickering and von Braun, which um, if you see the next one, you can, we can look at uh, a picture of them. This is at the press conference after their successful launch. The, they put the rocket up. It launched in 1958, and it was a success and an, an important event around the, around the whole world, international and national significance. So as soon as they got that data back, they started analyzing it. And at the same time, they're preparing Explorer 2 and Explorer 3 for launch. And those went up soon afterwards. But as they're looking at that data, it's, it's perplexing because there are no counts in some regions. So why was that? It was, it was confusing. We didn't know why. And so they go into the lab and they start to look at it, um, Carl McElwain in particular. He's in there. He's, he's bombarding the counter with, te with par charged particles. And he finds that 25,000 counts per second, and he gets that many in there, then indeed the Geiger counter shows zero. So now <laughs> there's a different question because now it's a case of, okay, we have lots of counts. We have a thousand times more than the cosmic rays that we had estimated that we have. So there were more rockets that went up. There were, in fact, in a, in a period of 15 months, there were about nine that went up. So Explorer 4 and Pioneer 3, they went further out and they were able to see the outer belt. So they started analyzing the, the four that I showed you the picture of. They're analyzing the data and they're trying to, to put it by latitude, longitude, and altitude, and they draw a map. And if you can see the next slide, you can see that a picture on the left-hand side of the map they drew. And you can see that this is an early picture of the radiation belts. And Van Allen had deduced that there was trapped particle there. And this discovery of the, of the, of the magnetic um, trapped radiation got him on the cover of Time magazine. So later satellites, as you've heard a little bit of Cress and, the, and one called Sampex, which I want to show a picture, actually a movie of Sampex now, if we could show that, shows how dynamic the area was. We had no idea back in the 50s that it would be this dynamic. You can see the red regions again. They represent areas where there are lots of charged particles. You can see at lots of times that there are two distinct areas. These are the two belts. But sometimes the outer region almost goes away and then sometimes it almost fills in the whole region. So what we have is a very, very dynamic situation. And with only the one satellite, either in the case of Sampex or in the case of Cress, they couldn't figure out and unravel what was really going on up here, why, why sometimes it's extreme and sometimes it's not. That's a job for RBSP. So what we have here is a kind of weather. And we've talked about this before. It's a, something we call space weather. And if you show the next graphic, 
then you can see uh, a picture of things that we've already mentioned before, single event upsets, charging, discharging, solar panels can be de degraded when on orbit. So we have, we have these, these weather ath assets or these satellites that are really affected by what's happening in space weather. And we are very dependent on our assets in space, so this becomes more and more important. RBSP will address one area of this. It will look at what's going on off with the satellites and assess the damage that's, um, well, not the damage to individual satellites, but the measurements that could cause that. So we are going to, with RBSP, both satellites will be broadcasting space weather data 24-7 whenever they're not doing science data. And that data will be collected by ground stations on, in the U.S. and also around the world. And if you could show my final graphic, this is a, um, a ground station that was built by the Korea Astronomy and Space Science Institute, specially to capture RBSP data. And so they're one of our partners. We have other partners around the world. And with, with these ground stations and their help, we, RBSP will be able to predict the extremes and the dynamic conditions of space weather. And that, with that, George. Thank you, Mona. And now to Nikki Fox, the RBSP Deputy Project Scientist from the Applied Physics Laboratory. Thank Nikki. you, George. So um, Mona's just done a really nice job of explaining where the radiation belts are and, and how we know that they are changing. Um, the, the difficult thing for us to work out is why they're changing, why they change different times to seemingly similar drivers. Um, we know that variations in the sun create strong geomagnetic storms here at Earth. Um, and, but what we don't understand is how we really truly respond to them. The Earth responds to what's coming from the sun. So we say if the sun sneezes, the Earth catches a cold. And if we could run my first movie, please, what you can see here is kind of some of the symptoms of the cold. You're looking at the radiation belts and how are they, how they are responding to the sun. The, uh, the red and green dots that you can see kind of zipping in and out there are actually representing the two spacecraft. And you can see them cutting first through the inner belt and then going out through the outer belt in a nice highly elliptical orbit. Here's the storm that's just hit the trace at the top there is giving you an idea of uh, when you see that big dip, the storm has arrived and you can see that the radiation belts respond very, very strongly to the arrival of that storm. Um, these, uh, this movie uh, is available on the RBSP and the NASA websites. And if you do watch it in its entirety, you'll see that the response to the two different storm events is actually quite different. Thank you. Um, so if you, um, if you sometimes we see the same events coming from the sun and the radiation belts pump up they get much larger in size and much larger in energy other times they actually shrink and almost go away and then there are times when the radiation belts seem to not know that anything has happened so if we can go to the next slide please um, when it comes to radiation belts we are not alone uh, all of the large magnetized planets in our solar system have radiation belt structures. So um, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune all have radiation regions very similar to, to what we see at Earth. And the processes that are causing these radiation belts are the same um, at the other planets as they are for us. If you look at the graphic, the bottom two panels represent the Earth and also the radiation regions at Jupiter. So we know fundamental particle acceleration is going on at each of these planets. It's also going on the same processes um, that cause acceleration in the solar wind and also more than um, 6,000 light years away that are causing the Crab Nebula to glow in x-rays. It's all fundamental particle acceleration. So I always like to describe the mission as a fundamental science mission that has really strong practical applications. Um, so we know what processes are going on in the radiation belts. We know it's almost like having a, a building, a, making a cake. You know all the ingredients, but you're not quite sure of the proportions of, uh, of each piece in each given storm. Sometimes one process is far, great, is far more dominant than another, and that is obviously causing the radiation belts to um, respond differently to seemingly similar things coming from the sun. Um, if we go back to uh, the, the 
the um, movie, please. Um, so RBSP was designed to answer the questions of how these radiation belts are responding. We do that by really looking at three different areas. One, why the radiation belts are, are pumping up or increasing. One, why the particles are lost from them because they do return to their pre-storm states. Um, and then how the ring current, which uh, Harlan will be talking about more in a moment, how that um, is associated with the radiation belt changes and how one is affecting the other. So we have two spacecraft that um, are on orbit. The reason we need two is uh, not just because it's better than one, but actually because we, they really are doing a job at looking at these different processes, trying to find out whether they're changing in time or whether they're changing in space. So if you imagine sitting on a, a life raft um, in the ocean and you suddenly go down and come up again, you don't know very much about what caused you to go down and come up. If you have a friend that is sitting on a life raft a little, little way away, you can say, well, did we both go down and up at the same time, in which it's a big scale feature like a tsunami? Did one of us go down and then the other one? It, how, how far apart did we see that feature? Did it grow? Did it shrink? And you can really start to look at the, the global dynamics of what's happening in the radiation belts. So that's why we, why we have two. Um, we do have them lapping so that sometimes they're very close together. They can be uh, as close as 100 miles apart. And other times they're separated um, by a, a distance of about three Earth diameters, so about uh, 23,000, 24,000 miles. So that's allowing one to be in the inner belt while the other is in the outer belt so that you can you know, do sort of cause and effect, see if the inner belt is responding to the changes in the outer belt also. Um, the, the highly elliptical orbit uh, does allow us to cut through the heart of both the inner and the outer radiation belt. Um, the, uh, why, why do you have to get up at uh, 4.08 in the morning? Um, uh, it's not just because the weather is likely to be better at that time in Florida. It was actually chosen very specifically um, to allow us to get the highest possible science return from the mission. Um, when, we want, when we start the, uh, the mission, we want the, the point that is furthest from the Earth or the apogee to be at local dawn. And then as the two-year mission uh, continues, that point actually walks all the way around so it, it, it will go to every single local region. It will take us two years to do a full sweep of all of the radiation region. And the most important thing is it will allow us to do the, the dawn to the midnight sweep twice in that two years. And that is where um, certainly it's one of the most dynamic uh, interests, uh, scientific interest regions. That's where everyone's very interested in. So that will be sampled twice. Um, the other big new capability that we have are just the wonderful science instruments that we fly. The spacecraft are identical, um, so we can do really good collaborating uh, measurements between the two spacecraft. We have suites of instruments that measure the particles, the full spectrum of energies, right the way down from the cold, dense plasma up to the very, very high energy uh, protons in the inner belt, um, which we're very grateful to uh, the National Reconnaissance Office for teaming with us and providing a, a detector that really is focusing on that inner belt, which has increased the science that we can do. We also have instruments that measure uh, the magnetic and the electric fields around the Earth. So um, I'm pleased that uh, I don't have to go into that anymore because we have our experts here. So George, that's enough from me. All right. Thank you, Nikki. Our next scientist is Harlan Spence, who was the principal investigator from the University of New Hampshire. Harlan. Thank you, George. It's uh, truly my delight to be here after working on this mission to its roots uh, far back to actually the late 90s in my case. Uh, to be on the cusp of a launch is truly exciting. Uh, what's even more exciting is we are going after a long-standing set of mysteries in the radiation belt with instrumentation that will uh, be fundamentally, I believe, transformational and allow us to make, answer old questions, but also to make new discoveries. If I could have the first slide, please. Uh, this is a, a model of the spacecraft, and if you could add the instruments now, I'd like to talk to you about the particle instruments that are on the RBSP spacecraft. There are eight different instruments per spacecraft, and we need eight because we're measuring across this huge energy range that Nikki mentioned from particles that are very, very low energy. In our units, we talk about going down to one electron volt, very low energy, 
to particles that are moving near the speed of light at billions of electron volts. Huge energy range we have to cover. In addition, we're looking at different species. We're looking at protons, uh, electrons, helium, and oxygen ions. So we have uh, a suite of instruments and several suites of instruments. There are eight individual instruments per spacecraft in three different investigations. The first investigation is called ECT, that stands for Energetic Particle Composition and Thermal Plasma. And there are three different flavors of ECT instruments that you can see there. One is called HOPE, one is called, uh, and that stands for Helium, Oxygen, Protons, and Electrons. The second is called MAGICE, and that stands for Magnetic Electron Ion Spectrometer. And at the highest energy range, uh, there's the, the last of the ECT instruments is called REPT. That stands for Relativistic Electron and Proton Telescope. Um, also on this sp each spacecraft is an instrument called RB SPICE. That's the Radiation Belt Storm Probe's Ion Composition Experiment. And uh, that instrument is looking at um, uh, of the uh, ions that uh, create the ring current. The last instrument is the one that Nikki referred to from the NRO, and that's called RPS, and that's the Relativistic Proton Spectrometer. I'll talk a little bit more about these uh, later on in terms of what science they will accomplish. Uh, next, I'd like to, to move on to uh, talk about some of the challenges we have with these instruments. Uh, this is an incredibly harsh radiation environment, and we're trying to make these detailed measurements across the energy range and across the different species of particles that we need to answer the science questions. But we're doing that in the presence of this just penetrating radiation. So we have fantastic instruments that are designed to do that. One of the things we have to do, in addition to the energy and to species, is to understand the directionality of the, uh, of the arrival of the particles into the instruments. And if I could have uh, the next slide, please. Uh, just a, a quick lesson. Uh, charged particles in the presence of a magnetic field have different motions. There's a, from left to right, a gyro motion. The particle will spiral around, gyrate around a magnetic field. In a uh, magnetic field geometry that's uh, uh, narrowing at uh, different locations, so they can bounce between these reflection points. And then lastly, they can drift across the field line. So we have gyration around, bounce along, and drift across. In the next slide, here's how those motions are uh, realized in Earth's magnetic field. So now you can see the Earth. You can see a green colored magnetic field line through the radiation belt. And you can see this complicated trajectory uh, in that one dimension. You can also see uh, near the equator of the Earth the directions of how the different particle species drift across the magnetic field line. Uh, the next movie will bring this to life. It's kind of hard to see it in uh, two dimensions, but if I could have uh, this movie, which shows a particle now gyrating along this blue now magnetic field line, and as we pan back, you can see that it's traveling along a magnetic field line. And as it gets closer to the planet, those field lines are bunching together and it will reflect. It will bounce back. But in reality, it's in three dimensions. We're now looking from the North Pole. And you can see that that particle is drifting around the Earth while it's doing this complicated motion. It's sort of like rubbing your stomach and patting your head. It's got all these motions going on at the same time. That was one particle, but now take trillions and trillions and trillions of them. They fill the radiation belt all moving in these complicated directions. Part of our job is to make those measurements of the directionality. Why do we measure them? Uh, to me, uh, a, a key element that we've heard before in terms of space weather uh, is that killer, killer electrons are space weather's villains. They are uh, fantastic things to observe from, from the point of view of the physics. There's this cosmic accelerator literally above our heads that's taking these particles and bringing them near to the speed of light but they also can inflict damage that we've heard about. So one of the primary uh, measurements we'll make with the RBSP mission are these um, relativistic electrons in the outer radiation belt that are at this very, very high energy. And we do that with the MAGICE and the REPT instruments that I talked about. In the inner belt, uh, we have trapped populations of the relativistic protons. And these have been very poorly explored in the past. And that's where the RPS instrument will be uh, flourishing. I'd like to go to the next movie, if I would. 
and talk a little bit about what the lower energy plasma uh, particles do. This is a, a movie from the image spacecraft of a region called the ring current. And here we're using a, a technique of remotely sensing that from a spacecraft far away. The region that you see illuminated is co-located with the radiation belt. And this region is bristling with electrical currents that disturb, inflate, and deflate the magnetic fields that control uh, how these very energetic particles in the outer zone uh, are operating. So we need not only to measure the high energy particles, but also the medium and low energy particles. That's the medium within which the radiation belts exist. Um, lastly, I'd like to show a movie that essentially is the baby pictures of our instruments. Uh, and uh, if you could cue that uh, roll. Uh, it shows the different instruments as they were coming to the uh, spacecraft. Here's the mag ice instrument. They all have, you'll see, single apertures, and they go on to the spacecraft in uh, specific locations, as that first visual showed. But I also told you that we need to be able to see particles as they arrive from all directions. This is where the spacecraft spin that you heard about is critically important. Uh, the spacecraft spin rate is um, uh, five, uh, roughly 5 RPM, so that means every 12 seconds, as these apertures that are fixed locations on the spacecraft spin around, we map out the sky and are able to build up this comprehensive picture of particle motion needed to answer uh, the fundamental uh, questions that become practical. So I would uh, just conclude by saying that uh, RBSP, in a sense, will be going right to the scene of the crime to watch the radiation belt particles in action, um, along with their accomplish ac accomplices. What is it that accelerates these particles? It's the electric and magnetic fields that exist and are co-located that determine their quote unquote bad behavior. So uh, many scientists have worked hard and long to get us to this point. Um, we're very grateful for the teams that have built these particle instruments that are, um, will, uh, are outstanding and like never before in two, two locations, it will be fantastic. The science team stands ready. We're eager, anticipating, and uh, very excited about the launch. Thank you, George. Thank Back you, here. Harlan. Our next presentation will be from Craig Kletzing, the principal investigator from the University of Iowa. Craig. Uh, so as Harlan has mentioned, we've all been working on this for quite a while now. Uh, we proposed oh, more than half a decade ago, and I need to say more than we are stoked to get this launched. Um, what I want to talk to you about are the electric and magnetic field measurements that we're going to make on the spacecraft. Um, there are two investigations. There's the electric field and waves investigation, uh, or EFW. We always use acronyms. Uh, and then there's the electric and magnetic field instrument suite and integrated science, uh, or emphasis. Uh, and those are the two sets of, of investigations that will look at the um, electric and magnetic fields. So if I take the spacecraft model here, I can show you the sensors that we use for the electric and magnetic fields. We have two sets of sensors on the ends of the booth. Uh, this is our search coil sensor. It looks like sort of three sticks at right angles to each other. We have the magnetometer sensor up here. Then you'll see here are some wire booms that come out. The spacecraft actually spins along this axis. Oops. And, um, and so these come out, and then we also have booms that go along uh, the spacecraft spin axis as well. And there's a slide here which shows the labels of each of these various different um, sensors as they come out. And so all of these sensors go together to give us a clear picture of the electric and magnetic fields. Now you might say, why do we care about the electric and magnetic fields? Well, it turns out they're critical for uh, the acceleration of the particles. That is what pumps up the radiation belts and makes them bigger and stronger. But they're also important for what causes the radiation belts to decrease. They can cause particles to get scattered so that they hit the atmosphere and are lost and never come back. And so by measuring these fields, we have the other half of the puzzle. We have the particles, as Harlan's described, and then we have the fields that cause them uh, to, to change their behavior. Now, we measure over a wide range. There's a lot of different kinds of phenomena that we want to measure with the field measurements, uh, from very low frequency, very slowly varying things, up to things as high as hundreds of kilohertz. Um, and uh, we, we need to measure across all these ranges, and that's what the instruments cover. Now, Interestingly enough, many of the important waves that we're going to measure are actually in the audio range. They're the same range as human hearing. They're radio waves, but you can actually play them and listen to them, and they make a sound. And so we can listen to a little sound clip here. So this is the noise of space. 
Uh, this is a phenomena called chorus, and that's because if you'll notice, it sounds sort of like a chorus of birds early in the morning, you know, and they start chirping as the sun comes up. Uh, and that was actually why this phenomenon was named chorus. People uh, measured this early on and said, oh, that kind of sounds like birds. And so this is one of the key wave modes that we're going to measure to try to understand uh, what's going on. Now, as I said, there's a zoo of different waves. So we have a slide that sort of shows the various different waves here. And you can see there are all these different locations. I won't go into the details of what all these different waves are, but I think one of the cool things about the radiation belt storm probes is you'll see the two bigger dots there that label where the two spacecraft could be when they're separated along the orbit. And one of the things we fundamentally do not know is if one kind of wave is happening in one place, is the same, is a, the same or a different wave happening elsewhere? Does one lead the other or follow the other? Does one happen and the other doesn't happen at all? We don't know. So this will be the first time that we've got two spacecraft with the same instruments. So so that we can actually start to figure out these kinds of questions. It's tremendously exciting to get this kind of data and put this together and understand something that we've just never seen before. Now when you're making field measurements, you have to worry about making sure that what you're measuring is what's in space and not anything coming from the spacecraft. And that's why we put things out on these various different booms here. And so we have to check that that stuff works. And so we have a little video clip here of us checking the deployment of one of the uh, emphasis sensors that comes out. And we do this in what we call a G-negated deploy, and that's where we do the appropriate things to simulate the fact that when the boom comes out, it's going to be in space and it won't be experiencing the effects of gravity. And uh, that test went quite well, I should say. Of course, um, you know, doing it, you've got all this apparatus to put the, uh, uh, negate the effects of the Earth's gravity. So it's actually much more exciting or much more elegant, I should say, to see this in space. And so we have an animation here that shows what that looks like when they deploy in space. And so you'll see one of the spacecraft sort of come up here and first the solar panels come out. Uh, and then a little while later, you'll see the, the, the booms come out with the, uh, the emphasis sensors on the end of them. Uh, I think this looks a little nicer than the test, but uh, we do the test so that this happens the way you actually see it here. And so we're really looking forward to get that going. Now, um, when we do these things, uh, we check everything out, make sure everything's working just fine. But we also want to make sure that the spacecraft doesn't produce a signature that we see on our various instruments. Uh, we say sometimes we want to hear the noise of space rather than the noise of the spacecraft. And so one of the tests that we do is we want to make sure that the magnetic field, I mean anything that has metal in it is going to have some magnetic field, but we do our very best to minimize that. So we want to make sure that the magnetic field of the spacecraft doesn't show up in our sensors. But this is a tough problem because you're trying to measure the, the requirement is that it has to have one ten thousandth of the Earth's field on the surface of the Earth is what you have to have uh, to meet the requirements to be quiet enough. And so how do you do that? Well, what we do, and I'll show you this clip here, is uh, what we call the swing test. What we do is we take the spacecraft and we hang it from a big cable. You don't see a spacecraft hanging from a string that often. You pull it back, but what we can see when we measure with the magnetometer is the part that's oscillating back and forth has to be due to the spacecraft. It can't come from anything else. And so that way we can verify that we have a nice clean spacecraft and everything's doing what we want it to. And in fact, we do have a very clean spacecraft, probably one of the cleanest spacecraft flown. And Finally, uh, I'd like to talk a little about electric fields. Now, those are uh, even more sensitive to spacecraft-induced uh, effects. And so we want to get the electric field sensors as far away as we can from the spacecraft. So we let them out on wire booms that go out a long way. In fact, the tip to tip from one uh, end of one probe to the other is longer than a football field. And those go out along what we call the spin plane. That's the plane in which the uh, spacecraft is spinning. Now, you can't do that, though, along the spin axis because there's nothing to pull it out, no centripetal force. So there are a stacer boom is used and they go out along the spin axis to get them as far away as you can. And there's a little clip here that shows the way the stacers uh, pop and then the booms extend out along uh, the spin axis of the spacecraft, as you can see. Uh, and so with that, we get these measurements, uh, we get them away from the spacecraft, we get nice quiet measurements, and uh, that way we're measuring the noise of space rather than the noise of the spacecraft. So we're all very excited. Uh, we're here, you know, we've been working on this for a long time, and uh, it's time to get this in space and get going. Thank you, Craig. And our last presentation is from Lou Lanzarotti, the principal investigator from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Thank Lou. you very much. Well, the RBSP mission is back to the future for me. It provides an unprecedented opportunity to arrive at important new understandings of Earth's space environment. This was the exact motivation that attracted me to this field of research nearly 50, 50 years ago. 
As the last mission of my career, I'm excited to be able to investigate Earth's radiation belts with state-of-the-art instrumentation flying within the belts themselves, seeking answers about the fundamental processes in Earth's space environment. Again, the same, same kind of questions that motivated me to join uh, Bell Laboratories and the space program nearly 50 years ago, as I indicated. I began my career, first, first uh, view graph there, I began my career at Bell Labs in 1965 to work on data analysis from the first active communication satellite, Telstar-1, and on the design and building of a radiation detector instrument for the first NASA test communication satellite at geosynchronous orbit, ATS-1, which we'll come back to. Uh, second slide. Unfortunately, Telstar only operated for approximately eight months in its low Earth orbit before it was seriously damaged by massive influxes of radiation, some natural, from the Van Allen radiation belts and some man-made from atmospheric nuclear testing that occurred on the day prior to the launch of Telstar on July 9th, 1962. The Bell Labs team that designed and built and launched the Telstar satellite did not have a clear picture of the space environment above our planet at that time. Second, uh, third slide. Before the launch of ATS-1, NASA's ATS-1 in 1966, which I participated in building an instrument up for and analyzed much extensively the data from, the radiation environment at geosynchronous altitude where all of our modern communication satellites operate was completely unknown. No measurements had been made there at that time. Uh, next, fourth slide there. Bern Blake, who's a member of the RBSP ECT team, instrument team, was also a young physicist who had an instrument also on ATS-1. He and I, are the two RBSP investigators who are from the very early days of exploration of Earth's space environment and that are back to the future, as I indicated. Fifty years ago, fifty years later, we understand much more about the hazards posed by highly charged particles in the radiation belt. But the fundamental processes that drive and shape the belts are still poorly understood, as we've heard several times today. Nearly forty years ago, a colleague and I, Mike Schultz, wrote this textbook on radiation belts, particle diffusion in the radiation belts. This was the theory of radiation belts. It's been the theory to today. Data from RBSP is finally going to prove this textbook correct. <laughs> I expect, however, we're going to find some surprises. And maybe we'll, if we have the energy, maybe we'll have to revise it. I don't know. We've been asked to revise it several times. We'll see. These mysteries of the uh, of radiation belts, and as we described here 40 years ago, or less than, slightly less than 40 years ago, are the focus of our mission as we've talked about. And I'm pleased to be able to be associated with it. Modern societies, and I've spent much of my career involved with applications of uh, radiation belt research and communications and things. Modern, modern societies depend on satellites and other space-based technologies that must operate in the belts makes the research and understanding that will come from RBSP's data invaluable to building better protected satellites in the future for communications, for navigation, for remote sensing, and importantly, for national security. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lou. And we're ready now to take questions. Please give the name, your name and affiliation when the microphone comes to you. We'll start with Marsha. Marcia Dunn, Associated Press, with a few questions. I'm not sure who to direct this to. Um, I previously asked, and I'll ask again. Um, you know, it's been more than 50 years since the Van you know, the Van Allen belts were discovered. Why, why take so long to to get to this point? Is there any? Is is it because it's such a challenge, complicated? And if somebody could just sort of compare that original Explorer one with what's going to be flying in a couple of days. I can maybe speak to the, the, the particle aspect of it, and maybe colleagues can add uh, to it. We have uh, modern microelectronic technologies now that were the envy, would have been the envy of the early explorers. The ability to pack highly sophisticated and uh, capable instruments into a very small uh, volume and s small amount of mass um, allows us to do things even now than, uh, better than when we first proposed the mission. So the advances even in the last five years have been uh, highly enabling in terms of the kind of measurements. And uh, a particular challenge, as I mentioned, with the particle instruments is being able to cleanly distinguish the particle that you're going after against the uh, spurious signals you get from the penetrating radiation. 
And the sophistication of the instrumentation, again, is enabled by this uh, advance in terms of the electronics. Oh, maybe I could comment on sort of why has it taken a while? And I think part of the answer is is that we didn't know if the radiation belts were as interesting as they've turned out to be for a long time. Um, initial measurements were made. Lou wrote the book, and okay, we think we have a pretty good idea until some missions flew about 20 years ago, so two decades, and said, mm hmm, we looked at that data, and uh, this is a little more complicated than we thought it was. Uh, but it takes a while to put together a mission, and, and those missions didn't have a very complete set of instruments. They had particle measurements and some limited field measurements, but not the, what you need to do the job correctly. And so people started working towards this, but it takes a while to put a mission like this together. Uh, and this is a phenomenal set of instruments. This is the best that's ever been flown in the radiation belts, and we'll make tremendous advances. And, and in addition to that, we now have two satellites. That's a very important part of this because with only one, you only know what's going on right there at that time, what's coming across. And as Nikki described already, when you have two, and especially we're going to vary the separation distances all along the orbit and throughout the mission. And so we're going to get a feeling for, you know, okay, we see it here. We don't see it right here. We see it here. We don't see it right here, but maybe we see something over here. So. That whole picture will be built up by the variations in the separation distances and, of course, whatever comes at us from the sun. Yeah, and just, just to maybe add to that, um, because I thought somebody else would say this, but they didn't, so I'll, I'll say it. We actually now know the questions that we want to answer. Um, so when, uh, you know, when they were first discovered, as Craig said, we thought they were just two very stable uh, bands of radiation. In 1991, the Air Force NASA Cress um, spacecraft really showed started to show how dynamic they were with the discovery of a new belt when a big shock came through and suddenly the, the, the gap that should be empty was now full. Um, SAMPEX picked up and then uh, is actually still working today, although sadly will um, re-enter re very soon, um, ha was able to really track just how that dynamics has changed over 20, you know, looking at 20 years. And also other missions that maybe aren't designed to look at radiation belts have returned really, really high quality data that when you add to other data sources have given us a lot of information and have really helped us over the 11 years um, since we did get together in September of 2001 um, to start doing the mission. It's, it took a number of years to really hone the questions get the right observations, choose the right instruments, and have the right technology in the right place to do the, do the mission now. And could Just a quick follow, is there anything on board or in the mission plan to honor Dr. Van Allen? Well, we're not allowed to put things on the spacecraft yes. that aren't <laughs> fully blessed by NASA, so there's nothing on board. Uh, James Dean with Floor today. Um, Ms. Ms. Kessel, perhaps, uh, since you're talking about broadcasting 24-7, I just wondered if you might be able to make any kind of analogy to you know, the modern media world in general and kind of what this these spacecraft will provide. Uh, you know, it's sort of like a 24-7 cable channel or something compared to the, uh, the Van Allen day. Okay, so we will be broadcasting data 24-7. We will pick it up from ground stations around the world within about 12 minutes, that data will be out there available to the public. So just seeing the, the kind of data that first comes back, the very low level products, that probably won't tell you that much, but we're also going to put that into models so that we will be able to show a picture in three dimensions that's going to be similar to what I was showing before of the dynamic changes we're going to be able to put that kind of picture out there within minutes. But that's not going to happen on the day one that we launch because we're, we're actually assimilating that data into models. And so that product will be available fairly soon, I would think. But then on an ongoing basis, it will be available every 12 minutes or so. So just like um, you see sometimes with, with uh, SOHO and I think, I think SDO also, pictures of the sun, then this minute the next minute or five minute, however often the cadence is that they take the pictures, and it's out there available to the media. These products will be available. It will be out there. Any further questions? Do you have a follow-up, James? Yeah. Um, could you just uh, address again if, if there's a problem with one spacecraft, how much does that limit you? And, and I wasn't sure. It's, I guess if I understand correctly, these, they're not communicating with each other, correct? They're just uh, independently 
uh, yep, that's right. speaking to, to, to the to the they, they, they don't um, communicate with one another on orbit. All the data are downlinked, and then uh, you know we we do the, the the collaboration between the two spacecraft or the coordination between the data sets on the ground. Um, if uh, we we are um, our mission success is to have both spacecraft operating for one year. Um, if one does sadly something happens to it then um, we can still do an awful lot with one spacecraft. Um, the, the really fabulous thing about the mission is having two and being able to do these multi-point measurements but as my colleagues have really stressed the actual instrumentation on board these spacecraft is so high tech and so cutting edge that even with one we would still we're still stepping through all of the, ra the uh, regions of the radiation belt still cutting through all the most important regions and still taking the best fidelity measurements we've taken yet even with just one platform. Although we do anticipate that they will both work. We Absolutely. have we have tested them extensively uh, in through on lots of different conditions and it is our we do believe that we will have them both and that they will operate and possibly even past two years. I was going to say that. Yes, These maybe even past. Very yes. tough birds. Very, very <laughs> armor plated spacecraft. Yeah. On the line now we have Irene Klotz from Reuters. So uh, Irene. Hi, George. Thanks very much. Um, I have a couple questions. The first is, and I'm not sure who'd be best to answer this, but I was wondering if there's going to be any collaborative studies with anything um, uh, at, um, with the Cassini spacecraft or any other spacecraft that are looking at radiation belts and radiation environments around other planets in the solar system. We don't, um, we don't have any collaborative efforts with that at the moment. However, we do with other uh, missions, the Themis mission that's currently operating. Uh, they, we have members from both teams that, that, that come together and we have discussed possible collaborations with them. And there's also a balloon mission that's part of LWS that was going to send 20 balloons up into space from Antarctica and that will happen in January of, uh, of next year, so 2013. And while those are up there, we will be able to measure precipitating electrons. Um, so we will be able to see that while we're measuring in situ in the radiation belt. So we're really excited about that collaboration. So that one and the one with Themis, and probably also we'll do things with Cluster, which is primarily an ESA mission, but we have some uh, US participation. So we have been talking to other people, ground-based assets and, and various other things, but we, I don't think we have anything particular. Oh, okay, Nikki knows that we do, so. Okay, we are, we are actually gonna have um, a, a like a, it's going to be very quick because it flies by very fast, but we are going to have a coordinated campaign with Juno when that um, comes through the magnetosphere next year. Um, they will be actually will be doing some cross calibrations with their instruments, looking at the radiation they measure in our magnetosphere and then the radiation that they measure at Jupiter. So that is it's it's quick because man, it's moving fast, but um, it will be it, we will get two cuts as it comes uh, past and through the Earth's magnetosphere. So. Um, thanks. And uh, maybe for, for uh, Dr. Lanzarotti, hi. Um, I wanted to know if, um, why, why was it not suspected before the, the launch of uh, Telstar that Earth would have something like um, radiation belts, since I believe it was known that the, the planet had a magnetic field already? If you could maybe explain a little bit about um, the, uh, um, what causes the radiation belts and, and why its initial discovery came as a surprise. Thanks. Uh, Irene, that's a, that's, that's a long, long history, as you probably are aware to some extent. Um, when uh, John Pierce, actually, uh, Arthur Clarke proposed a satellite in a, in a uh, certainly after the Second World War, a geosynchronous altitude, it was a science fiction kind of thing. But John Pierce at Bell Laboratories, uh, proposed the echo uh, reflection uh, satellite, which was launched in 1960 with uh, NASA. And then John Pierce, in about 1954, had proposed an active telecommunication satellite. And that was before the discovery of the radiation belts. So I, I think it's quite fair to say, and it is fair to say, and knowing, the, uh, knowing him a little, somewhat, uh, we overlapped a little bit to labs, 
before he retired and went to Caltech, um, there, there was no, no expectation that the Earth's space environment was not anything but benign. Cosmic rays had been discovered about 50 years prior to the Van Allen radiation belts. Actually, 100-year anniversary of the discovery of cosmic rays is just this year. Well, uh, Dr. Hess over in, in Austria flew uh, his balloons uh, with him in them and discovered cosmic rays in July, August uh, 1912. Uh, but other than cosmic rays, there was no reason to expect the Earth's space environment wasn't benign. And in fact, the physics text that I used in 1956, 1957, and I've shown this at other talks that I've given, uh, showed the Earth's magnetic field with just nothing out there except for the stars and the sun, and I've shown that in the past to show what we really didn't know 50 years ago. And so then Van Allen's discovery of the Van Allen radiation belts did, did put some surprise into the, uh, into the situation, and when Telstar was built, they did take into account some of the, uh, some of the uh, fact that there was radiation, and they did the best that they could. Telstar was built with just transistors, uh, d discrete transistors soldered together. And as a fact, matter of fact, our ATS-1 instruments were built with just discrete transistors soldered together with very limited uh, memory. There were no ICs at integrated circuits at that time. And they were all transistors put together to make your, to make your uh, 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 memory, ch memory uh, devices and all. And so one had very limited uh, radiation. There was no radiation hardness of these transistors for Telstar. And in fact, AT&T flew, uh, flew some uh, transistors that they used as radiation monitors in order to monitor the, the Van Allen belts at Telstar altitudes to get a better idea. But, they didn't, but the, the, the expectation was a satellite would probably last longer than it actually did. But, the data were so poor by that time, 1962, and during the design in 1961, 1962, that there was just no way to, uh, to harden uh, in the same sense that we use today uh, that, that spacecraft. As a matter of fact, it was just a 50th, if I can advertise here for a moment and allow me to go on if I might for a moment. There was just the 50th anniversary of the launch of Telstar held last month at Bell Laboratories in New Jersey. Several of us were asked to give talks there. There's a video, a, a YouTube video talking about that event, which is quite interesting to look at. Walter Brown, at that time, who hired me at Bell Laboratories to do radiation belt research, as a matter of fact, uh, gave a talk. Uh, on his instruments, uh, on his little transistors that he flew on Telstar to measure the radiation environment. And some of that data is still used today. And then I followed him talking about space weather and how it's important for communications to today. So Alcatel Lucent, uh, while no longer building spacecraft, is still involved and interested in this, uh, in this uh, field of, of endeavor and research, as, as can be evidenced by the anniversary that they held and people that they asked to come and give talks back uh, from their prior staff. Did, did, that, did that help a little bit, Irene? Um, yes, that does. But um, I also was wondering if there's, I, I know this is a, a, a huge question as well, but could somebody just give kind of a basic science explanation of why Earth and the other planets that have magnetic fields have radiation belts? That's a very good question. I don't think we really understand very well. Mike Schultz and I talked about a little bit in our book here, and my colleagues who have done a lot of theory also, we have all these very low energy particles in the solar wind that are coming out from the, uh, from the sun. Somehow these, these are energized, these are transported into the magnetosphere and, and, and to make the radiation belts, but it's really poor, very poorly understood and that's the whole prime purpose of this mission. I, I should point out, uh, one thing I did forget was back in about 19... About 1954-55 time frame, which was uh, when uh, John Pierce was talking about Telstar and, and low Earth orbiting uh, active communication satellites, there was, a chat, there was a professor at the University of Maryland named F. Fred Singer. Fred Singer still uh, is, is active in certain areas of, re of research. Uh, even today, he's close to 90 years old, uh, I think, uh, mid-80s anyway. Um, and and he, he, he did some calculations where he showed that if you put, it, put some particles into something like a magnetosphere, it, there was no such magnetosphere at the time, but into a dipole field like the Earth had, you could probably trap them. But his paper was sort of an obscure one in American Geophysical Union uh, abstracts somewhere, and, and he never talked about how you could highly populate them, but he did talk about they could be trapping. 
And so there, there was some research at that time and uh, speculation and discussion, but nothing intense. And, and we really still don't know how these low energy particles in the solar wind get in the magnetosphere and accelerated and decelerated and how they populate. That's the whole point of this mission. If I could maybe just add on onto that, Lou, the, um, the thing that, that really is making it different for the planets that have them and the planets that don't have them is the strong magnetic field. So we know that the, it is the, the magnetic field at those planets that is trapping the radiation. We, um, some of the, most of the radiation is already inside the magnetosphere. Our magnetosphere itself does a tremendous job of, of protecting us from the particles that are in the solar wind. So a lot of the particles are already living in the magnetosphere and get injected and trapped. And I think that, that really shows why Harlan and, and Craig both stressed how important it is not just to, me to measure the particles, but also to measure those magnetic and electric fields, because without those, we wouldn't have the radiation regions that we see. Um, can I follow on? Uh, it, it might take too much time. So we've well, got time for, okay. for one more question. Okay, all right. You, you, can, you can go ahead and make a, a brief point, and we'll, then we'll take one final question. Well, I, on, on the point of ray, waves, on, on the NASA satellite ATS-3, we flew a wave instrument to measure whistlers. It wasn't a very successful instrument at all, and it was, what, what it get, it, looking back now, the history is that we just didn't know anything about the waves that could affect these particles at that time. It was very primitive understanding, which shows the importance of the kind of sophisticated instruments that we're able to do now, the comparison. Okay, we'll come back here for one final question. Hi, uh, Christopher Hill from the Avion newspaper. I just wondered uh, how the data from this uh, mission will be used to protect future spacecraft or satellites that may be uh, traveling through this region. Um, a number of different ways. The, the easy answer to that is to really do a far, far better job of modeling the environment in which they'll have to live and work. Um, there are sort of, and it's two sides of the coin. Um, you don't want to send something up that is not adequately shielded and it either, you know, gets um, crippled by a space weather event or its lifetime is dramatically decreased by, say, solar panel damage. Um, the same token, you don't want to over um, engineer something. You don't want to launch a battleship when, you know, a dinghy would have done. Um, so you, you don't want to be really, it costs a lot more to launch, a lot more to build, a lot more to maintain. Um, so you want to be able to engineer the design of the spacecraft so that you really are putting the right amount of shielding for the right region and also to have a very good um, prediction of how long those spacecraft will last because again you don't want to if you've got operational spacecraft you don't want to l not launch something quick enough and have a gap but you also don't want to launch it too soon and have you know on orbit storage well you know you could have you could have waited two years so by having the really accurate models of the environment through which they will travel will really dramatically improve the design of spacecraft the models that we may I add? The models that we currently have are about 30 years old. This we can really use an upgrade to those models for future design and engineering purposes. They're almost old, as old as Lou himself. <laughs> <laughs> if, if Thank you, say, Nikki. In addition, to the, <laughs> in addition to the design models, we also have uh, physics-based models that the RBSP data will really provide um, critically important information that's needed to. to deliver better predictive models and as we build up uh, extreme events we'll, we'll understand the range of the kind of events that we need to shield against as well. Right, a good, good chunk of the models now are sort of empirical models and getting to this where you actually understand what's happening allows you to, to do better predictions. And of course the other aspect is our space weather broadcast and there are the modelers are now thinking about how can I be pulling this data in that's coming down all the time so that we can at least do you know maybe only at this point an hour or two in the future but that's still more preparation than we have right now. All right that uh, will conclude our briefing. Uh, one programming note as far as launch coverage the start time is unchanged for a launch on uh, Friday, August the 24th, our NASA TV coverage will start at 1.30 a.m. Eastern Time for a launch at 4.07 a.m. And that will conclude our briefing today. Thank you very much.